Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the program. Every dog needs a bone to chew on. Plumber Moxley's bark is worse than his bite. And all Sting wants for Christmas is his two front teeth. It's the We Bit Off More Wrestling Than We Wanted to Chew edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. And to join me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, he can fill your cavity no matter how big it is, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. And in the era of tape trading, I had a pretty large collection of canvas cavity videotapes that I got from the source. Except the problem was the fillings kept dropping out. And the tape kept rewinding and starting over, yes. Oh, but speaking of starting over, it feels like we're almost ready to start over a new era. It's about to begin here on the experience and the drive through but we can't tell if we only had time. We can't tell the people just quite yet. And there's no hotline you can call. But um, within days, we expect to be able to alleviate the, the woes and fears of so many of the Cult of Cornet listeners over the past few months who have put up with uh, technical difficulties that were temporarily beyond our control with downloading or uploading or cross-checking or uh, pausing and rewinding the program. Did I cover all of the all the various things they were having issues with? Streaming. What? Streaming. Oh, that's what they were having issues with. Yes. Well, we, we were up shit creek without a paddle, but now we bought a boat and we're fixed to be cruising... Not down Lake Havasoma, but Lake Smooth Programming. And and we're almost ready to... <laughs> Where's that? Well, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's across from Shit Creek. It's in a separate <laughs> tributary. And we're almost ready to tell people, but... And all, I'm sitting here looking over my shoulder anyway, because the weather, the past week, we have taken the week off, and we were going to put out the omnibus. We should mention that, but this technical situation that we're in the middle of we're we're going to do that when it is solved and resolved also so if you were waiting for that it's still coming but the past week since we have spoken to the people and we have had nothing but shitty weather here after shitty of different kinds now it's not all been the same but none of it's been good we have had Waves of severe thunderstorms, unhealthy and hazardous air, high heat and humidity, hail and flash floods and all the things that go along with it over and over and over again. And right now, if I sound like I'm, a, I'm in a bowling alley at some points during this program, it's because of the thunder outside. But did I even tell you we have talked a couple of times off air, but they had tennis ball sized hail in French Lick, Indiana the other day that did some considerable damage to their big resort area up there. That's not far from Louisville as the crow flies. At the same point, they had a tornado in southern Indiana, north of us, southwest of us, was 100 mile an hour straight winds, uh, straight line winds about 30 miles away. That was the, the thunderstorm. We've had inches of rain, one town down south of us, got like three inches of rain one morning. But when it hadn't been raining, the air quality has been hazard in the unhealthy category. That's why I sound like I've been screaming for three three weeks. The unhealthy category for everybody, not just senior citizens and the high risk groups, but no, they're like, if you're human, don't go outside. Limit your goddamn, because of the Canadians, the wildfires up there, and have you you had it with the red sun and everything, but now we've got it. Has the direction of the wind changed, or did you guys put up a dome? Oh, no, we got it again here, too. I mean, not as bad as the first time, and not as bad as they just had it in Chicago and Detroit and other places. But it came back over here again. Well, we didn't get the cool red glowing lights and everything. We just got it. It's like you're standing next to a campfire or a cookout. The visibility the other morning was like 20%. You couldn't see across the river. And it was smoke in the air. And But uh, that's Louisville now. Chicago and Milwaukee, apparently the other morning, uh, our 
air unhealthiness index was over 200. That's like, that's unhealthy, stay in your homes, don't go anywhere. In Chicago, it was 400. Chicago tied with like some city in fucking Bangladesh somewhere for the world's worst air quality from the Canadian wild. I knew the people in Canada hated punk, but I didn't know they would go to all the trouble of setting their own selves on fire just to try to poison him. So then, then the heat came in. And not only do we have we had heat, but the humidity, dew points in the 70s, right to the west of us down in Hopkinsville, the dew point, 80 degrees. And the heat index is going to be 115. And the, the poisonous air and the heat and the humidity, it's like constantly sitting around, hosing down a campfire in a dirty sauna. And they even said, we're we got dirty rain the other day. That's where there was so much pollution and fire particulates in the air that when it rained, it came down dirty. I've heard of a dirty Sanchez, but never dirty rain. I want to ask you about where you heard of that, but what did it look like? What was it like witnessing it in person? Well, you couldn't see it. It just, it just was splotchy when it landed. It wasn't like it was raining black globs. It's just it has, you know... It'd fuck up your car if you just got it washed or whatever. But fortunately, nobody's washing their car around here because it won't stop fucking raining. All right, and it's the 4th of July weekend. Don't be a dick and torture all the pets and animals with your fucking fireworks, assholes. Put yourselves in the hospital some other way. Leave the explosives to the professionals. I say this every year. There's some asshole in this new subdivision behind me who thinks he's going to replicate thunder over Louisville in his driveway. And it drives Harley crazy. And he ran, ran the deer off every year. And I can't imagine how, how bad the little kitty cats take that and the bunnies. But also, if you don't want to think of the animals, which are most important, think of your children. Have you seen the video? It, it was on Twitter and a bunch of people were retweeting it. I assume it's, it could have been just discovered from some time back or it could be new. But there's the ring doorbell camera, right? Where I see, you see the, the, like the fish eye shot, right? Of course. And there's people in their lawn chairs and they're, they got their coolers, they're sitting out in the front yard, and there's toddlers running around playing, and these women are leaned back in the lounge chairs, and these guys are over by the pickup truck, and you see across the street the homes, they're all nicely kept and everything. And this kid shoots off something in the driveway, and then this other kid, he goes around behind the pickup truck and lights something, and it starts, and then shit starts flying at the women in the lounge chairs and they start to stand up and then the shit blows starts blowing up and continues to blow up and people are grabbing children and fucking running and diving and the fucking truck catches on fire and the goddamn front yard's ablaze and it, when it ends i think the world ended at that point that's what they deserve loud noises Fuck. I don't remember exactly all the details, but this just reminded me of it. It must be a few years ago now. There was some video of some family did a big outdoor gender reveal party where the two parents are going to reveal the baby is a boy or a girl. The baby's not born yet. They had some kind of big balloons or something, and it was just like a giant flame one. <laughs> and like, you know, it just destroyed the party. I don't know. I'm not trying to laugh because I don't know if anyone was hurt, but it was a complete disaster. Well, as long as you don't know, you're free to laugh. It yeah. would only be in bad taste if you knew someone was immolated. Can you imagine going through all that to make a big deal out of something so stupid? And then just all goes up in flames. Quite literally, it all goes up in flames. It went up in flames. Uh, anyway, we got a lot of stuff to talk about on the program today because since we haven't recorded in, my God, it's been five days since we put anything on tape. That's a record since Christmas. Uh, we got to catch up with all the wrestling this week and the wrestling-related programs. And 
Also, I was watching TV last night. Did you hear about the news? I saw this on the news last night on TV, 6 o'clock news here in Louisville. WDRB carried this. Matthew Riddle, convicted of child molestation. Did you hear about this? Matthew Riddle was convicted of child molestation. I saw it last night. Matthew Riddle, really? On the WDRB News here in Louisville. He's some fucking guy. I think they said he's from southern Indiana, 37 years old. He was slightly balding. But there it was, headline, biggest day, Matthew Riddle convicted. He's going away for a long time. I wonder if there's any relation. Awful. You're horrible. I am not. I'm just trying to give people a little news tidbits that I've come across that I've seen. I saw a news tidbit. You know, I have a problem now. I can't see any headline about Sylvester Stallone and not think of fucking knucklehead Moxley. <laughs> the headline, Sylvester Stallone shoveled lion poop, mugged Woody Allen before Rocky fame. And then I, I was just start laughing at myself. I'm like, <laughs> Sylvester Stallone shoveled lion poop, or as I call it, working with Jericho. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, in the news. All righty. Well, that was. There's no goddamn transition. <laughs> <laughs> there's always a transition. Blood. Well, there's. Blood. But thankfully, I don't need a transition because we don't have. This is the spot we normally would uh, perpetrate Reggie's Corner. But since we've got so much to talk about on the program today and, and so many of these nightly, it seems, uh, marathon extravaganzas of wrestling, Reggie's Corner will return next week here on The Experience. And you've got a preview through, preview through the drive through a preview of the drive through that we're going to have in a few days. You've got a brand new acquisition to your memorabilia collection. Well, we're going to talk about this a little bit. It's a really cool newspaper. Chicago Sunday Tribune, September 9th, 1934. The big headline we're going to talk about, Yankees three home runs, whip, socks. Seven oh, come on. Garrick drives out number 44 to lead offense. No, the uh, big story here, Londis versus Lewis. And we have here the, uh, hey, well, I can't, we can't talk about this yet. It has the, well, ticket, no. it has the ticket prices. Oh, my God. Well, it, it, more on the drive through because yes. you just got that in and you have not perused it. There's several pieces on the match. And by the way, when we say front page news, that was literally the biggest headline on the front page of the Sunday edition of the Chicago what, Tribune, was it? Well, it is part two, the sports section. But yes, it is the front page of it. Front page of the sports section. I've I've actually seen. And this is coming up on the match. This is not reporting after the match, right? Part two of 10 parts in this newspaper. Wow. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, okay. So it was a daily thing, but that, that match actually made the front page of many major newspapers across the country the actual front page front page because it was legendary for its time and the all-time gate record to that point, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway... More of that on the drive through um, Before we go any further today, we're going to talk about the Dark Side of the Ring episode on JYD this week and catch you up on Raw and SmackDown and AEW's programs and the money in the bank. By the time we finish this thing, that will have happened and come and gone. Uh, but we wanted to mention real quick, because the news just came out yesterday, that uh, Darren Drozdov passed away. Draz. And I, if you were a a fan of the WWF in the late 90s, obviously, you know who he was. I don't know where the modern generation is fully on being aware of Draws, what happened to him. I mean, it's obviously it hadn't been kept a secret, and there have been numerous stories and pieces on him over the years, but he passed away. I guess he was, what, 54, I think they said, correct? I don't know for sure. I have to double check. Well, I was hoping you had noticed because I because th I remarked that I was going to call him a kid, but then I realized he was almost as old as I am. But he started late in wrestling because he had played pro football, and I guess that made him about 
30 years old by the time that he started breaking into business, and he only wrestled a, a short time, I think like a, a year and a half or thereabouts, two years, whatever. But he was famous in the Beyond the Mat movie because he could, he was famous from a football game where he puked on the ball, apparently. But he could puke most of the time on command or at, at will. Nobody really commanded him except for Vince puke, but he could do it if he wanted to at will. And not only did they you know, feature that piece, you know, where Vince said, he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna puke. But I gotta be honest, I was in the office and I, this was another thing that Bruce told me, right? When he would come in with trying to be excited about the things Vince was excited about. He said, we're signing this guy and he can, he can vomit at will on command. I was, okay. And, you know, and that's the thing that Vince was wrapped up about. But thankfully, as as we met Draz and got to know him and he started training, everybody, you know, uh, fell in love with the guy as far as a, a trainee, a a student, you know, somebody to, to have in the locker room. You know, everybody liked him and there was never any problems or issues or whatever, except that the one... <laughs> The first time, I can't remember what the circumstances were. I've tried to block this shit out of my mind, but Brian, maybe you remember. Do you remember the first time he was supposed to vomit on live TV and he got nervous and couldn't throw up? That's right. What What was the context of that? I don't think there really was much context that I remember. <laughs> you just said, here, this guy's going to throw up, and then he couldn't. I don't remember there being too much yeah. context. I mean, remember, they... And I don't think this was a service to him. They brought him in and put him with the Legion of Doom right away as puke. Yes. Yeah, that well, well see, I had been I had been around him for a while longer because I was involved with the the training camps that Dr. Tom and Dory Funk Jr. were doing, and he had made some spot shows. So I, you know, I knew him as Draws before Puke. And then, obviously, Hawk was having his issues at that time, and the, the Road Warriors had come back, or Legion of Doom, as they called him up there, and they thought, well, we might need to replace Hawk, and they were going to try that. But in some way or another, I just remember that. that was the. Thankfully, Vince didn't hold it against him, but that was the thing, is the guy that can throw up whenever he wants to gets nervous and can't throw up. But they got past that you know sorry period of everybody's career the legion of doom the whole nine yards with puke thing and he became draws and he was a great prospect and again you know he was a guy that everybody loved coaching or you know working with he was starting late but he had a lot of athletic ability and was starting to get you know the picture of what the business was and you know, again, of, of anybody to be in the ring with. And, and this is something that, you know, honestly, everybody talks about the valve. Somebody's going to get their neck broke or somebody's going to get paralyzed on uh, these indie shows or the crazy matches in AEW or whatever the fuck. Well, somebody actually did. And it was not even doing anything that particularly crazy. And it was a guy who's, size and muscular musculature and physical conditioning and size of his neck was twice that of some of these guys that are doing these cannonballs, multiple flips off the top rope through furniture. And it still happened. And it happened with D Lo Brown, who is of, of all of his reputation in wrestling as being a good worker or being a nice guy or be whatever also has never to my knowledge, ever hurt anybody else except me. He potatoed the fuck out of me when he was a green rookie in Knoxville. He punched me right in the fucking head, but it didn't hospitalize me. Um, and it shows that it, no matter what any, no matter how highly trained you are, no matter how, how good a worker you are, or no matter how strong you are, or what shape you're in, a situation can occur where you either 
are given the move and somebody else gets hurt or you're taking a move and you get hurt. And that's, you know, that's why that, um, yeah, everybody who knows anything about the wrestling business freaks out when they see these people doing this shit, either that or if they don't say something about it, that's because they just don't care whether somebody breaks their neck or not. But that was the thing. It was a complete accident. I think D had said in an interview that I saw that I don't think either one of them, I know he didn't. I don't think either one of them ever watched the tape back because they didn't want to see it, but I watched it because I wanted to see, you know, exactly what the fuck happened. And as I can recall, and this was, you know, 24 years ago or whatever, it, and it, it didn't air obviously, but I had connections. It was one of those fucking deals where, you know, one guy doesn't have the exact right balance. The other guy doesn't fucking go up at exactly the right pace. It can, it happens all the time to every professional. And so it wasn't anybody's fault. The definition of an accident is you didn't know something was going to happen. Was there something that each guy could have done to prevent this from happening? Yes, if they'd had the ability to say, well, let's stop and let's look at the video and now let's see what we shouldn't do and correct that. Well, you can't do that in live time. So anyway, the from what I've always understood, the company took care of him after that and he, he made sure that he had everything he needed for his you know, his care from that point forward. And that was the thing is everybody said that draws maintained. And I think I, I may have seen or talked to him once after it happened, but he maintained a great uh, outlook. He didn't blame anybody. He didn't fuck it and say, I give up. He carried on with everything as best he could and figured out other reasons to, to have things to look forward to. And we saw a little bit of that. Remember he was on dark side of the ring. Well, yes. And you know, and worked with the, the dark side guys on that show. It was a two seasons ago or whatever. So, you know, overall, I'm, I'm sure that at that age, you know, his injuries and or whatever side effects they've had probably contributed to him passing at an early age. But, you know, I, I, and I hate to hear it, but he, again, impressed everybody as being, you know, this is the toughest guy on earth to go through this and not let it whip him. Is that a situation that any wrestler, any young wrestler, inexperienced wrestler could just get thrown into? And I know that Hawk and Animal didn't have a lot of experience when they became road warriors, but that's a little different. But for in 1997, 98, I forget exactly when. For a young wrestler to be thrown into that role, can anyone succeed in that role? Um, what do you mean uh, as being a new member of the Road Warriors slash Legion of Doom? Yeah. Um, no, but Vince, Vince never understood how over they were because they were never really over for him, and he didn't see everything else. So he didn't understand that you were trying to replace, you know, a member of. I don't want to say a member of Laurel and Hardy. Maybe I'm just trying to think of an irreplaceable duo that could not be. You couldn't do it. Which one's uh, Hardy and which one's Laurel? Well, I be, you know, Hawk would have to be Stan because he was the, <laughs> the fun one of them. Well, Ollie. Well, Ollie. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but, but, you know, no, he, he just, no, it, it, Nobody experienced or green could have replaced a member of the road warriors. It did not work and wouldn't have worked. Um, it is interesting though, to think what if the road warriors didn't have Paul Ellering? What if they had Hal Roach? Well, then in that case, they would have been set for life. They could have moved from the short subjects into the features. And then they would have been iconic. Um, instead of ironic. Uh, but anyway, back to draws. The point is, um, that was the thing also is that I thought where you were going was, well, the road warriors, you know, when they were green, they were dropping people on their heads and blah, blah, blah. Somebody else could have got hurt. Well, no, I was actually just well, going with the idea. They, 
were unknown and they were thrown together and treated like stars right away and they got over like stars right away even though they really didn't know what they were doing yet at all well yes and um, but draws was being thrown into a gimmick that was already over that had already worked uh in two companies although differently in wwe than everywhere else yes and and here also is a point that i was going to make too is that accidents continue to happen at greater frequency over the last 25 or 30 years as the style has changed because when green guys like can you imagine if there had been such a thing as dives and you know all the craziness with the furniture now when guys like hawk or animal or any of those big motherfuckers in the late 70s early 80s started breaking in it it was if back then the injuries were potatoes and fat lips, knocked out teeth and black eyes. But over the last 30 years, the size and physicality of the guys has diminished as the risks have greatly exponentially increased and guys are still getting fucking injured. But can you imagine if it was these 300 pound maniacs that, that were green and breaking in now doing the shit they're doing now, I don't know anybody would have a career lasting longer than a year and a half. Anyway, having said that, um, again, you know, it was unfortunate and a complete accident, but that's something that can, what happened to draws can happen. And I think more people should be aware of it. And, and not have to worry about being able to handle it like how he handled it to try to prevent it when it's when it's not necessary when you're taking unnecessary risks this was a fucking sit out power bomb that D'Lo had done a million times it wasn't even a risk really but everything's a risk but slight if that and definitely not unnecessary and shit can happen so what are you fucking doing diving off these goddamn ladders while their legs are broken? Or poor Sting. Yeah, that's the big... I mean, as you're talking about this, I'm thinking we could talk about examples from just the past week. Danielson. I mean, plenty of guys are getting hurt all the time. Well, you know, and... Honestly, I'd love to blister one of these New Japan guys, but Danielson's injury comes down to happenstance. The guy maybe slightly careless dropped an elbow off the top rope and landed on his arm. But the idea of dropping an elbow on a guy off the top rope is not revolutionary nor highly dangerous, but things can happen. But the thing with Sting, when we get to that and we talk about it, he probably got off as easy as he could have because if he'd have done something else, which I will analyze, he could probably broke his back instead. But nevertheless... All right, moving along, because we've got a lot of things to cover. And this week's episode of Dark Side of the Ring was on the Junkyard Dog. And you know what I think the prop besides the Ernie Ladd comments, I think all the talking heads let us down. Because this, this didn't really profile his wrestling career from start to finish, nor did it necessarily tell us the story of his athletic career pre-wrestling, including um, the time that he walked out due to discrimination off of his, what was it, his high school football team? Yeah. And then the heartbreaking story of him going to his daughter's graduation, missing it, and then turn around trying to drive back home and getting killed in the car wreck was neither fully fleshed out nor explained at the end to the point where it, it was as tragic as it was in real life. But the whole focus, it seemed like, was trying to say that JYD was the greatest black wrestling star of all time or African-American, depending on who phrased it. But I th it, in the end, it shortchanged us on the story, and too many people were talking that were, you know, I mean, DiBiase was around dog quite a bit. And I guess, you know, Tony Atlas and Coco and, and Jake and those guys were in 
especially in the WWF. J Jim Duggan got no problem with him, but I think it was too, it wasn't focused. And it, it wasn't that I didn't, uh, what I was going to say was that they shouldn't have been saying he was the greatest black wrestling star of all time. He was bigger than that. He was as big as any of the white guys. I think they should have focused on he was one of the biggest at his in his peak wrestling stars of all time. And I love the Ernie Ladd comments because Ernie's gone, but this was from an interview he did years and years ago because Ernie was close to dog, mentored him somewhat as Booker there, saw the relationship between him and Watts. That was pertinent. Everything else was, you know, just saying things that everybody already knew. I don't know. Let loose on it, and then we'll go through it chronologically. You know, I have my issues in general with the series and some of the decisions that are made with it. I thought this was disappointing. It just wasn't a coherent story. They relied too much on Jake. There's yeah. things that Jake can add to. Jake was there in Stampede. Jake was there in New Orleans. But Jake wasn't there when... Jake wasn't there in Mid-South Wrestling in 82, 83, 84. So he can't really speak to any of that, but he kind of was. He wasn't there when Dog left. And again, the story was just disjointed. You know, all of a sudden in the middle of it, they went back to talk about his childhood. I was like, all right, good. I thought they were going to talk about him leading the walkout. Here's something to show. No, nothing about that. Surprising. I also thought they kind of miss... When I say they... The talking heads and then editing that into the show misrepresented a lot of things about his WWE run. He came in, he was instantly, if not number two, the number three babyface in the company. And I question two versus three because Slaughter was still hot off the Sheik feud. But he came in and he was pushed as a top guy right away. His theme music was over. He was over. Vince was screaming about him dancing with kids in the ring. One of the first round of action figures. First round, well, uh, actually round two of action one, figures. One of the first round. Yeah, round two of action figures. Intercontinental title match at WrestleMania. First pay-per-view wrestling classic at the end of 85. He wins the tournament beating Randy Savage. After that, it wasn't... See, they presented it like he started doing more drugs because he wasn't happy with how he was being used. How he was being used, in part, was because of the shape he was getting in and what he was doing. Remember, they, well, put, and, and, they well, put him and, in the feud with the Funks because they knew that Terry would be able to get something out of him because Terry could get something out of anyone. But also, he was still being used on top in Mid-South in 84, and when we've done the Mid-South discussions and everything, we've talked about how the dog of 81, 82 wasn't the dog of 84, or vice versa, however you would say that. And but he was still being used on top. But he was still he was using drugs then before he went to New York. And remember, they tried to get that over. Watts on commentary would talk about the dog bulking up because of the big competition. Yeah. <laughs> How is he gonna beat King Kong Bundy if he doesn't bulk up? And I'm sure he, if he'd have ever got dog to get back in the gym and lost the weight, he would have said, Well, look, he's leaning out to try to fight the big fat guy. <laughs> That's exactly right. But, you know, that's the thing is, um, and Jim Ross had some pertinent comments because he was there through the whole run. And, you know, they showed the early clip of JYD when they were still doing studio wrestling in, in Mid-South and Shreveport with the, his original gimmick. He brought the wheelbarrow with all the junk from the junkyard to the ring. And that's what started getting him over. But you could see the, the Mid-South footage of him with the power slams, the thump, and the entrance and the people going crazy and the barking and the body that he had and the intensity and just it was it was not just the right guy in the right moment he had all the fucking tools and the push and everything and they tried to replicate that in New York but he got and let's face it at the time the difference in the Mid-South in-ring style and the WWF in-ring style couldn't have been more pronounced. You went from the one of the hardest places to work in the ring to one of the easiest, and he still couldn't, you know, keep up after a while with that. And, boy, the one clip of him with the really short hair and the little finely 
groomed mustache and his face big. It just, it, he looked like a guy in a sitcom, not the junkyard dog that looked like he was a badass five years before that. That pissed me so, off about WrestleMania three. You know, he wrestles King Harley race with uh, queen fabulous Mula and Bobby Heenan in his corner. <laughs> Uh, because Samantha Fox pulled out, so they needed a woman to go to the <laughs> ring, and they pulled Mula into it. But the dog, he didn't have the fro, even the tightly groomed one. He got rid of the beard. All of a sudden, he looked like a different person. Even when he gained weight, when he still had the beard and the mustache and a little bit of hair, he still looked like the junkyard dog. Yeah. But WrestleMania three, he had a weird look that didn't work. And, you know, uh, all respect to Tony Atlas... But I'm not sure that the girls in Louisiana were very friendly to the boys. But I don't know that I heard and certainly never experienced. Oh, I wanted to ask you about this. Yeah. Any of the girls. I mean, it's happened on limited basis, but it wasn't like Tony Atlas is talking about like as a regular thing. Oh, yeah, I'll bring these. You need some money here. And he'll have several girls come over and pay a hundred bucks a piece. A hundred dollars. In 1984, it was about three or 400 today, and I don't know that most of these girls could afford it. Now, we have heard stories. How much of, was ringside? <laughs> uh, eight, eight to ten dollars, <laughs> 12, 15 if it was a scaffold match or the last stampede. We've heard stories of certain individuals in the wrestling industry transitioning into gigoloism, and or there's been some well-off benefactors female benefactors of certain wrestlers but it wasn't like a thing where you could just call hey guy oh, you need some money here i got some girls that come up no i i'm sorry and i will say that J junkyard dog in mid-south was probably making in 1984 if he'd have stayed the whole year he would have definitely made more than we did because he was a single and the money wasn't getting split up five ways. It was getting split up two ways, you know, two, two guys in each tag team and a manager versus two guys in a single match. He would have made 125 or 150 that year, maybe, but he probably also during the big run with the birds and the blinding thing, he was easily at 125 or more in mid South, just that territory and the outdates he was making, you know, during that early period where he got hot before Houston officially became part of Mid-South, you know, 125 to 150 grand a year, which would be, again, three times that in today's money. And I, I definitely know that he was still talking about and everybody was still talking about when we got there, the scuttlebutt in the locker room was that dogs weak for the dog collar match at the Superdome and whatever else they did that week was $12,000. So figure that. Uh, That's how we got that Mercedes. Well, I was about to say 30, uh, $35,000 to $40,000 a week in today's money. And and he used to drive around in that Mercedes. He called it, that's the car that Cowboy bought me. Because he went out and bought a fucking Mercedes with his week's paycheck. Um, hey, the story, because I'd never heard it before, that Teddy Long told about the dog saying he was in a bathroom stall and he heard Grizzly Smith and Bill Watts having a yeah. conversation and Bill Watts called him the N-word. The reenactment, which was a bit over the top, had the dog <laughs> kicking through the stall and some big fat guy walked through. I don't know who that guy was. Had you heard that story before? No. And see, here's the thing. And, you know, I love Teddy Long. And Teddy and I have never had a crossword. And I believe that he believes that. Because JYD told him that. The problem is, is that what was... J and also, remember, Teddy didn't get into business until, uh, what, as a referee, 87-ish, 8-ish, he was refereeing in Atlanta TV. And... And so he would have been around dog in the, in the WWF. He would have been around dog when dog came to WCW the first time in 1990, when Teddy no. was managing or 89, 88. Right? No. 88. That's right. He was in an 88 real quick, but re regardless, 88, 90, that period of time in WCW, it was several years removed, but basically what do you expect JYD to say? 
they spent all the time on the program showing pictures and and having everybody from JR to DBS, all the other people say how close Watts and Dog's relationship was, that Watts took more time with him than anybody, that he groomed him and made him to be the star, and blah, blah, blah. And when Teddy said that, uh, they asked Watts for comment. They had the graphic on the screen that Watts said it was complete fiction, never took place. And I believe that because for several reasons. Number one, Grizzly Smith, despite all of his other issues, was the best stooge in the world. His job was to report if he heard anything to Bill Watts, it would be detrimental to business. And because he was the best, the best stooge in the world, he was usually right about these things. If Grizzly Smith had gone to Watts and said, we think we're going to lose the junkyard dog, he's going to go to New York, Watts would not have blown him off. Watts would have said, why do you think that? And what do we need to do? And should we get dog in here and talk to him? Or something like that. He wouldn't have been so frivolous. He wouldn't have used that language about JYD. Yeah, the war but he also started. wouldn't have he wouldn't have blown off the the goddamn the thought or the concept either. Because remember, Watts was more wounded than and surprised than anybody. Nobody knew Dog was going. And and it just suddenly he was gone. Bobby Fulton once told me, because he was in the babyface locker room with Junkyard Dog, that he remembers like Dog coming in like Gotta get ready. Gotta get ready for the fight. We gotta fight Vince. We gotta fight Vince. And then, like, the next show, he wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was just like that. Um, and so, anyway, the point is, he, he would have questioned that. What's going on? He didn't know anything. He wouldn't have used that language about JYD. He wouldn't have been so frivolous. But here's the thing, what I was going to say. JYD had to say, he, he didn't want to say, yeah, this guy made me a fucking fortune and gave me this spot. And I was one of the biggest stars in the world. And he paid me enough in a week. I bought a Mercedes and blah, blah, blah. And I left him with no notice and went to work for Vince for more money. So he created a backstory that the audience that he had would ease. Oh, well, you did right. But nobody else has ever heard that story from any, or didn't hear it when it happened or for years after it happened. And it doesn't fit for a variety of reasons. And, you know, and then, again, the guy that, the, the, the booker that Watts primarily relied on to help him with JYD was Ernie Ladd. And remember, he actually fired Ernie as his booker when he first brought JYD in because Ernie didn't get it. And then he brought him back However, a few months later, whatever the fuck, but Ernie told me a story himself and he's told it on tape. He brought, Watts brought JYD in, sent him down to New Orleans. I think they were at the St. Bernard Civic Center that night. And so Ernie calls Watts the next morning, as he did after, in the morning after every show. Well, boss, your boy don't have it. What do you mean? That junkyard dog, he don't have it. He worked with Scott Irwin, the Super Destroyer. I put him 20 minutes through to see what he had, and halfway through his tongue was lolling out like a long red necktie. The boy can't go. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, Bill. And fucking Watts said, you're fired. And Ernie said, and besides that, what? <laughs> Say, you're fired. I sent my new top star down there so you could see what he could do, not what he couldn't do. You're fired. And Ernie's a point taken. So they put him in a ring for five minutes, had him power slam people, and he got over. But so anyway, no, that uh, that uh, was JYD trying to just tell some guy's stuff to get heat off himself in the locker room years later. If JYD hadn't left Mid-South in 84 for Vince, and again, Mid-South was a rough territory for the drive, and he was a top star. Yeah. And he'd been doing it for years before Oklahoma got swallowed into Mid-South Wrestling, and then afterwards. What do you think he would have done? He was already a touring... He was one of the last touring territory stars, because at the very end there, went to Florida, was in Georgia for a while, 
showed up in Mid-Atlantic in 84. Memphis. Memphis was on the Parade of Champions for World Class, was on other World Class shows. So he was going to various places. He was in magazines. Not only because he was the star of the Louisiana Territory, but also because he was a black wrestling star. It was amazing. He was on the cover of magazines. His pinup was in Pro Wrestling Illustrated. Pinup. (laughs) (laughs) And he was very sexy, too. But he was one of the last guys, like a Kamala, too, who the gimmick started working and he started going to different places. If JYD hadn't gone to Vince in 84, do you think he's staying with Watts until Watts closes up? Or do you think, is he someone Dusty would have wanted to bring in? Is there any other option for a JYD? No, I, I, yes. uh, You asked 17 questions. How do I answer them? Dusty would have definitely, besides a weight or drug or reliability problem, let's say in, you mentioned the trips and the schedule plus his outdates and dog had Pee Wee Anderson driving him and it got to the point at the end where dog was doing more outdates. He wasn't going to fucking Cushetta, Louisiana or whatever and being on a spot show. Um, and obviously the more big towns he made, the more money he was making. So he was going to, as I said, if he'd have stayed in 84 plus all the other stuff he was doing, he would have easily been making over 150 grand a year. And still with those trips, DiBiase told me himself one time, he said, I spent 18 months in this territory and I hated the wrestling business and my hair started falling out. I had to go somewhere just to keep my sanity because it would wear you down and the fights with the fans and the style in the ring and the trips in the car. And it was just insane. Right. But it dog had a driver and he was doing more outdates and the level of star that he was, if he'd have kept in condition and, you know, been right by 1986, Dusty would have had to have him. And Watts was by then his business, the economy in the core territory, blah, blah, blah. We've told that story. He wouldn't have been able to pay dog that money or that kind of money, but Crockett would have. So if Dog hadn't gone to work for Vince, he definitely would have ended up in Jim Crockett promotions. And again, for fuck's sake, North and South Carolina, Georgia, the heart of Crockett promotions and the whole, the core territory had incredible populations of of black fans. He would have been the the biggest black star in the history of Crockett promotions if they brought him in at any time between 84 and 86. Yeah. And I mean, he was equally as over with the white fans also. So it would have been just another big name coming in like they were trying to get all the other big names. But in this case, you would have had a guy who was tailor made for the core audience of the core territory. And Dusty would have seen that because Dusty was one of the biggest heroes to the African-American community in Florida and Georgia. You've seen the pictures when he went to Detroit and won the U.S. title working for the Sheik, they fucking leaped in the ring and fucking, they couldn't pick him up. But they were swarming all over him, hugging him and kissing him and all the pictures I think Brad McFarlane took. It's insane. The So yes, Dusty would have seen that as long as Dog was in shape and could still, you know, make the towns. He didn't even have to be, I mean, Dusty used Jimmy Valiant past Handsome's athletic prime because people loved him. So. JYD with the horsemen around wouldn't have even had to have worked like he did in the old days. Now they brought him in in 1990 and tried to have him work with flair. And that was abysmal, but that and was, they made it about race, which it killed it right away. Well, and that was only, yeah. Um, but that was four years later than 1986. And at that and point, he was still over. If you go watch, he was, the Pops, he was he still was over. Yeah, he just couldn't go anymore. But yeah, he would have been on Crockett's roster for sure if he had not gone to Vince. There was no place else that could pay him the money that he would have wanted and been able to draw. Yeah, that 1990 match with Flair at the Clash was considered at the time, and I haven't watched it in years. The worst Flair match of the era. No one could remember a worse Flair match. And remember, one of the saddest things 
when they did the Superdome in 89, Flair Steamboat, two out of three falls, they had Butch Reed versus the Junkyard Dog on that show. And the dog came out with a band, you know, a whole New Orleans <laughs> thing. There was no one there. Like, even his yeah. fans were gone by that point from New Orleans. Well, uh, to be fair and to be honest, it, at that period of time in WCW, all the fans were gone from everywhere. But anyway, and that's, and also, they made it sound like Vince Jr. didn't, and this was a Coco, and I love Coco to death, but Coco where, until he went to the WWF, and probably never fucking seen a show, heard a result, seen a program, whatever. He's going from what he was told pre-1980, what was it, five, six, whatever. He went in 86. Okay. But they made the point that Vince Sr. used a lot of black wrestlers. There were wrestlers of color, and they showed a bunch of the pictures. And then Vince Jr. switched, and, you know, everybody's white. Well, again, there's a nuance to that that nobody was... And I'm not trying to defend Vince McMahon Jr., but from this I am, because it was bullshit the way that the talking heads phrased it. Vince Sr. was promoting the Northeast, not the whole country. And so, yes, when he had Johnny Rods, or he had, you know, he was going for Puerto Ricans, Italians, African Americans, and somewhat of the Polish, right? He wasn't going for fucking rednecks. Uh, the hillbillies were the furthest thing from a... A, a an act, as they say, that would draw actual hillbillies. The way they laid it out here was pretty funny too, because like Vince Senior had all these guys: Pedro Morales for the Latinos, yeah, Bruno San Martino for the Italians, the Wild Samoans. And I'm like, wait, for who? The Samoan people? These guys who can't speak English, who just talk yeah. gibberish and eat bones? Well, that's another strongbow. I think for the massive northeastern Native American <laughs> population, yeah. But it uh, again that it was streamlined to a national modern promotion, and some of those gimmicks went by the wayside, and some of those people went by the wayside because they weren't major major stars. Um, and then if, you know, well, go ahead. If Junkyard Dog showed up in WWF in 1984 and saw what was going on, whether it was right or wrong. And just started working out like crazy. And however much he can get back into good shape, he got into good shape. Got on the gas, everything. Would Vince have ignored that or Vince have pushed that? If he looked like he did in 1981. Oh, he would have pushed that like crazy. Ahmed Johnson. That, uh, Vince was going to give anybody that looked great body-wise a chance whether they could work or not. And a lot of times whether they could talk or not. And Dog could look great, and Dog could talk at an upper echelon. So, and, and he could work if you worked around him, as DiBiase mentioned. So he was, if Vince was in love with Ahmed Johnson or a few other people that we could go up and down rosters and name, he would have pushed Dog to the moon if Dog looked like 1981 Dog and was talking like that. And the promos alone. It, I think at the end, I don't know whether Dog had just given up or whether he's burnt mentally or with the whole thing or whatever, but also when he had something to, and maybe he did, he did, I'm sure he didn't take scripting well or being told what to say. Watts would tell him the topic to talk about and he would do whatever it was like the dog would do it, right? And I set in on a few of those. Well, you saw the clip of me. I told that story for the, Tales from the Territories uh, series, but they they put it in this program that, you know, and they showed the footage of him. <laughs> the rib, when he snatched me around the neck on the, on the Mid-South TV when I was confronting him, and he's going to grab me and give me the hangman. He's going to lift me up by my neck with one arm, right? But the rib was the Midnight Express are supposed to run in and attack him but they couldn't leave the locker room until he had grabbed me or the people would tip it off, right? And remember in Shreveport, that boys club, 
you had to come down the long row of stairs and then run across half a basketball court to get to where the ring was. <laughs> and he had to fucking hold me. Like, so he snatched me around the neck and I grabbed his wrist and up we went and he's choking me and my eyeballs are popping and I'm trying to brace myself up on him. And I see the boys and they're still 60 yards away. I'm like, oh my, f and I could feel him weakening a bit, <laughs> but he had me up for that until they got the boom. But God, that was a rib on him. He had to hold my satchel ass up with one arm for about 30 seconds. So anyway, where was I going with that? Oh, the promos. That was the thing is he was a natural at talking to people and the smile that wasn't fake or when he got mad face, that wasn't fake. You believed he was mad. And he could come up with shit. It wasn't like, you know, he just uh, did a dry promo. He was fucking witty and he was funny and he could do the the inside promos, ribbon on it. We, we would sit there in Shreveport at Channel 3 from 9 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon doing local promos for every market, the baby faces and the heels, whoever was featured. And then we had to leave and drive 200 miles, go to a town and work that night, right? And most of us that lived in Alexandria had driven up that morning, left the house at 6.30, so it was a long day. So he liked to, as many of us did, entertain everybody. And every time that we got to the Jackson, Mississippi promos, that's when all the boys would sit down and watch. They'd come back from the Coke machine, conferences behind camera would end. Have I told you about the, the George C. Culkin promos? Oh, I know about those. Yeah. Well, you know, because you're a Mid-South fanatic. But George C. Culkin was the promoter in Jackson, Mississippi. He had wrestled as George Curtis. He was Jack Curtis's, was it his father or his uncle? I think it was his uncle. His uncle, uh, yes, because yeah. George C. Culkin, his 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 father, his brother was Jack Curtis. Right, he's Jack Curtis Jack Jr. Jack Curtis Sr., Jack Curtis Jr. was his son. It generally happens that way. So anyway, wrestling family, but they'd moved into promotion. George C. Culkin owned Jackson, Mississippi. That's why when he and Watts were on the outs, the Culkins, the Curtises, operated Mississippi as their own territory, and it, you know, was not part of Mid South. They it, politically they were connected, and they'd been there for thirty years, right? But when Watts started using dog and sending dog to the main event in Jackson every show. As legend had, had it, George C. Culkin called up the cowboy and wondered why he's sending that N-word up here on top of my cards all the time. Because if you can imagine any Civil War plantation owner, you could, you could cast George C. Culkin in the part, right? So every week, when we're doing the local promos, if Junkyard Dog was on the Jackson promo, he would be up there with Reese or Bowden or Jim Ross or whoever at the podium, and he's, I can hardly wait to get up to Jackson, Mississippi again. You know, I was there last week, and I was sitting on the front porch of my good friend, Mr. George C. Culkin's house, and we was eating some fried chicken and watermelon. And I was saying to him, George Culkin, it's going to be a sad day when I get a hold of that no good hacksaw butch reed or whatever he's doing. And he's just driving. George Culkin out of his mind at every time that he would call Watts and go, why is he talking about me? George is your town drawing. Are you making more money than you've ever made in your life? <laughs> and, uh, you know, he just, uh, the promos were worth listening to for the boys and the fans. He could fucking entertain people. So, and, and, the the one thing that I thought about, and and the or of course at the end of the episode they made the point that he went from working a Superdome to working at Walmart in ten years, which is you know sad. But can you think that he died in 1998? Five years later, when the fan fest started, and the Legends reunion shows, and the comic conventions started crossing over to wrestlers he would have had a second career he could have made a fortune doing all that shit because not only because of his name value and his entertainment factor 
Yeah, and again, if you grew up in the 80s, even if you weren't a wrestling fan, you may see him a little differently because he was on that cartoon. That was on CBS on Sunday, on Sunday, on Saturday mornings. Yeah. He was, a and his action figure was everywhere. And if you were a kid who wasn't white and you were a wrestling fan and you wanted a wrestling toy, there was very little representation. It was him, eventually Tito, but that was it. I mean, the Iron Sheik, I guess, technically. And well, now I'm just going by what country. I was about to say, did did you, if you were a kid, did you want to represent the Iron Sheik or be represented no. by the Iron Sheik? But, you know, for baby faces, for a good guy, whatever you want to call it, JYD's action figure was a big deal. And, uh, you know, every kid had to have that when I grew up. Plus, he did a duet with Vicky Sue Robinson, for fuck's sake. Grab them cakes. That's right. Anybody that stood next to Vicky Sue Robinson is okay in my book. You know why I uh, hate that song? Because it replaced Another One Bites the Dust. That was their attempt to, we need to do something because we're not going to pay Queen. Yeah. Let's have the dog do a song with Vicky Sue Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> but no, honestly, a, a dog, he was great to work with. It was, it, well, it wasn't great. He was easy to work with. It, it, by the time we got there, you know, as we mentioned, he had slowed down and etc. So the matches were easy every once in a while. The big fucking spot in a Superdome. There's 23,000 people there. Watts has beaten up Bobby and Dennis and got juice on them and beaten them and thrown them out of the ring. And to get me in the ring, to strip me down, take my clothes off, put me in a diaper and feed me a baby bottle, and once again in front of 23,000 screaming people. JYD is going to give me the slingshot over the top rope. So there I am. I jump up on the apron and I'm right in the middle and I'm holding on. And boy, when he hits that rope, I'm going to fucking fly, right? And I swear to God, I don't know whether he was hung over or what the effects were of what he'd been doing or if he hadn't been to bed for a few days. But besides the fact that Watts was mad in that match because Dog gave him the coldest flat-footed tag I've ever seen in a fucking tag team match. But then dog goes to slingshot me. And instead of running and grabbing the rope where I was and giving me the big heave ho in, he turned around and grabbed the top rope at the turnbuckle and kind of went, eh, eh. and I was all oh, shit. I had to do the whole thing myself. And it looked like a monkey fucking a football. It was fucking ugly. I looked like I just committed suicide of my own volition and launched myself head first over the top rope. But so the matches were easy, but by that point they weren't barn burners, but he was fun in the locker room and everybody loved the dog. Next week, Adrian Adonis. Did you love him, Brian? Because I never met the motherfucker. I never met Adrian Adonis. I just finished his biography that I thought was a nice book. I'm interested to see how they do with it. Again, I was disappointed with the Junkyard Dog one. It felt like they had an idea and they didn't know how to completed or put it together it never really came together for me but uh, adonis is an interesting story so let's see if they get it right well that's the thing is this one's this and this and i sound like ain't lola now this and here this and here jimmy um this one is going to be one that i'm interested in because this is another guy that i've never met i never met adrian adonis once we talked about matt bourne i was at one or two TV tapings where he was in the building, the complete, I was never in the same place as Adrian Adonis. He's again, one of the few people in the wrestling business, even as a photographer. So I, we were two ships passing in the night for 15 years or whatever, until he met his untimely demise. So we'll see what happens. That's in two weeks, actually. Well, no next week because there was no, there's no dark side on the 4th of July. There's only light at the end of the tunnel. That's actually the day Adrian Adonis died, the 4th of July. Well, son of a bitch! You know what? You're right. They should have put that episode on the 4th of July to commemorate. You wouldn't want to commemorate his death. You want to... Well, in, on in honor of this uh, was the day... Well, it's and what better day to honor somebody? Hey, let's all remember when we love this motherfucker. And then he died. July 4th was what? Adrian Adonis, Brutus Beefcake's parasailing accident, Joey Morella and Harvey Whippleman's car accident leading to Morella's death. 
I think there's another thing I'm not remembering right now. I'm not leaving a fucking house. Enjoy the fireworks. Yeah, fuck you. <laughs> I see anybody around here with a firework, I'm hitting them with a garden hose. Speaking of being beaten with garden hoses, should we talk about Raw last week? Very, very briefly, because it was a long time ago and we watched a lot yes. of wrestling since then, so I don't know how much... Uh... Well, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I just I wanted to recognize a couple of things, and I wanted to call to task a couple of things. Um, they're continuing the, the build with uh, Dominic Mysterio and Cody, and I can't wait to see how this works out. It's, it's genius booking in that you put Cody against a guy that He's got, Dominic has more heat per se than anybody in the company. He's not the biggest star or the biggest draw, but the people are having fun now really disliking him. But he's still the, the heel that you can beat and not take the heat off of him. And Cody needs more heels to beat till he gets back to Brock. So this is genius. You, and, and it elevates Dom to be in the ring with the biggest baby face in the business. So anyway, and they, they did the whole uh, deal with Dominic and Cody and, and Rhea, mommy, face to face, and Rhea will speak for him because when he opens his mouth, they, the fans drown him out. But um, they, you know, they're continuing to build the deal where this time Cody offered him a free shot and Dominic started, but then he turned around and walked out and... Cody promoted the Money in the Bank match and called him Mommy's Little Boy. And I'm just, I'm liking their interaction again. And, and it's, it's, it's perfect. I agree. And then we had Shaky Nakamura against Ricochet with Bronson Reed at ringside. It was the same three guys going back and forth. Ricochet won. Did you, did you watch Ronda versus Raquel? Unfortunately, I had something I needed to do at that precise moment. Yeah, at that just exact moment, and there was no such thing as a DVR. Well, I'll tell you that I thought, I will watch this because I'm a fan of Raquel's, and she's big, and she's got some size. And Ronda Rousey, as they started, seemed to be trying, as opposed to sleepwalking like she's been doing lately. And Raquel was the, you know, strong and used her power and woman handled Ronda and they were having a different kind of match. And then suddenly Liv Morgan just tackled Shayna and Ronda went for an arm bar and rolled her up one, two, three in about two and a half minutes. And I'm like, oh, well, okay. And uh, Seth Rollins and Finn Balor got in another fight. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You always say you never watch Miz. Jim, you never watch the Miz. Well, I decided I'm going to watch the Miz because he's wrestling Tommaso Ciampa. And for anybody who didn't see what happened, <laughs> here comes Tommaso Ciampa for this match. I love Ciampa's work. I want to see more of him. He's been off with the injury. He's coming down the aisle. Miz jumps him, runs him into everything, beats him up. And took forever. Nobody tried to help, and Miz walked off and left him. No match. But fortunately, they had a match with Dominic, but it was against Tozawa, and Dominic beat him in two minutes. And then they had a summit with all the girls in the Money in the Bank match. Trish and Becky and Bailey and Eo and Zoe and Zelina. Key Largo, Montego, baby, where did we go? Down to Bermuda, Bahama. Come on, pretty mama. I'm vomiting. I'm puking. Oh, because they won't stop talking. I just decided to fast forward to the fight. Brian, did I miss anything on the verbiage? You missed a lot of the notes that Carl Wilson would normally hit, but uh, no, you didn't okay. miss anything else. All righty, well, Becky punched Trish. They had a sloppy six-way. Zelina hit EO with her shoe. EO dove on everybody, and Becky climbed the ladder and got the case, in case you were wondering. All righty. Now, there was actually something that I legitimately watched, and might we might be serious about it if you remember any of this in your, in your stupor that you were in because you had other things to do. 
Yeah. Gunther against Sami Zayn. Ring any bells? <laughs> I, I mean, I remember seeing these men in the ring in a match. Yeah. But it sounds like you have deeper thoughts about this. Deeper thoughts. Well, just colloquially, I'd like to uh, go over a few of my deeper thoughts. They wrestled. Again, Gunther's almost flawless. I love to watch him work. And Sammy can sell, and that's what he's he was going to be, the underdog guy selling and fighting from underneath. And so they've got the makings of something good here. And they get started. They had the night's best headlock right off the bat. They actually can perform arm drags. It's amazing how much basic, simple maneuvers register when you never see anybody else doing them anymore. Uh, and they went to break in two minutes. And I heard, God damn it. But when they came back, they had a good match. They go back and forth. Sammy had to work and finally made his comeback to make Gunther take a bump. And when he did, it got a big pop because people have been waiting on it. And they go through several false finishes. And boom, then Owens gets on Kaiser, and Gunther puts the big boot to Owens, but Sammy dives on Gunther, and things are happening. And the people are chanting, Sammy, Sammy. And Sammy suplexes Gunther into the corner, and Owens and... What's his name? Gerhardt Kaiser? Kaiser Wilhelm? Wherever the fuck he's from. <laughs> They're fighting, and here comes the other one, the one that's hurt, the bald one, Leonardo da Vinci. And he comes out on crutches and gets up on the apron, and Sammy turns to face him, and he literally takes the crutch and jabs Sammy in the throat with it, kind of. And Sammy staggers into a powerbomb, one, two, three. And I was like, oh, fuck. They, when they came back from the, from the break, they gave them a little bit of time. They had a good match. These guys are capable of all kinds of different things, and they continue to have the worst cheap, quick, get-out-of-it finishes that I've ever seen in my life on these television programs. So good match, lousy finish. And then... The heels started heat on the baby faces, but here came Matthew Riddle with the Jefferson County Police Department on his tail. No, then came the real Matt Riddle, and he made the save and beat the heels up with a crutch. Boy, howdy. Indeed. Yes. I don't know what else I could add to that. You know, I'm not a fan of Riddle, so him getting involved in this doesn't excite me. Gunther's great, but... The stuff with Sammy and Kevin leading into this hasn't really been doing it for me either. Oh, well, they whatever they're trying to get Owens to do now with this losing his temper thing, and he's just being silly about it because you can tell when he doesn't like something, he's going overboard and being silly because it is stupid to just suddenly, what the fuck, he's flipping out constantly, but they... They had him over with the as the opposition to the bloodline. They win the belts, and they got nothing for him to do afterwards but have scripted interplay with various teams that people are not really wanting to see him wrestle. So there you go. Finn Balor against Carmelo Hayes. They went to break in a minute. They came back, and in three more minutes... Finn Balor double stomped him, but I was past caring. Now, that match ended at 10.26 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Brian. Right. And the bell rang to begin the next match, which was the main event, at 10.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 19 minutes. We didn't... Wh what we got was breaks and plugs and backstage comments and announcers plugging shit and entrance and break and another entrance or whatever the fuck. But it took 19 minutes to get one match out and the uh, next match started. <clears throat> that's anyway, that's WWE TV for you. Cody Rhodes versus Damian Priest. And again, I want to see this because Cody's been impeccable and Priest is really looking like a top guy. And they had a good match. 
Um, nothing crazy, but at the same time, they did the same thing. This time they went to break in three and a half minutes. So they, they tried to get us to halfway get hooked in it. And of course, Dominic's at, at ringside also. So basically when they went into the meat of the matter, Priest had got the heat. Cody kind of arm dragged him off the top rope in a kind of a cool little move and then made a comeback. Boom, boom, boom. And then Rhea draws the referee and Dominic trips Cody while he's going for the cutter. Priest hits a choke slam. They get a pop on the two count and Cody manages to kick out. And then Cody foils the razor's edge, shoves Priest into Dominic, hits the Cody cutter and the crossroads. Boom. One, two, three. And they built to the finish and got a pop out of it. And then Dominic ran and hit Cody from behind again and ran back out. So good, solid match. Good finish. A couple of those were in this three-hour program. And apart from that, it was two hours and 30-something minutes of boringness where nothing yeah. happens and nobody gets hurt as opposed to the other side where too much happens and everybody gets hurt. Not an exciting episode of Raw. Not that too many of them are, but this one, there was not too much that stood out. But in the theory that McDonald's has one of the shittier cheeseburgers but sells more of them than anyone else, again, people in large numbers are watching Raw or sleeping through Raw with the show on to catch what's going to happen with Cody and what's going to happen with the bloodline. Am I basically right? Is there anything else going on that anybody gives a shit about? You know, I would put Judgment Day in the mix just because I think there is something happening with that, whether it's the Dominic reactions and people wanting to be a part of that. Yeah. Well, or and, and their, their current uh, anti protagonist is Cody, so that's part of that thing in there. And Rhea Ripley, we know. Yes. Okay, I apologize. But that's about it. Who are you apologizing to, me or Rhea? I apologize to you that I didn't mention Rhea and the Rhea and Priest and Dominic. Almost all the Judgment Day. Otherwise, is there again? Is there anything? Is anybody tuning in for the ongoing adventures of Alpha Academy featuring Shoosh Boy and Model Girl? I can't imagine who enjoys that. So that's, uh, and and we'll talk about, I can't remember, uh, the ratings for last Monday's Raw were again well in, uh, well up near 2 million, were they not? I don't have them in front of me. Hold on, give me a second. I will All right, well, well, I'll just vamp, as Bill Barons would say, while you do that. But the point that I was making about the whole thing is, we know that SmackDown again last week did big numbers and I expect that it's going to be fucking huge again for the one that took place last night as we're doing the first part of this program Friday night June 30th because of the big Roman Reigns solo Usos confrontation in the main event and I'm saying there's literally nothing else happening on these WWE programs that you would think anybody would give two shits about but their ratings are going up Raw, on average, did 1,973,000 viewers. They, and, and if you have that information in front of you, where did they st what was the hours? Where did they start? What was 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and 11 o'clock? 8 o'clock? Or, well, yeah, you know what I'm saying. 8 o'clock was 2,129,000 viewers. 9 o'clock, 2,132,000 viewers. 10 o'clock, 1,965,000 viewers. And the final quarter, 1045 to 11 p.m., Cody versus uh, Damian Priest with picture and picture. No, no picture and picture. Uh, 1,744,000 viewers. Okay, so they lost th 300 and what is that? 385,000 people from start to finish of a three-hour program, which is somewhere around 50, uh, let's say 16, 18% as I'm eyeballing it of the audience, but for the first two hours, they only lost 100, is that? Yes, 
That would be a hundred and uh, basically one hundred sixty-four thousand people, which would be a little over five, maybe six or seven percent of what they started with. Looking at the data that WrestleNomics uh, has here, it follows the trend line. I mean, everything was primarily above two million until right before ten o'clock, and then it's the ten o'clock hour. You go from one million nine hundred sixty-five thousand to one seven nine five. And then you kind of settle down and go back up for the main event, but it follows the trend each and every week. And they've, since uh, Roman is on SmackDown now, uh, they have kicked this thing in the ass. SmackDown's biggest rated quarter, more often than not now, if Roman is on last or the Bloodline business is on last, that's the, the last 15 minutes is the highest rated part of the show. We've been saying it. They train the audience to know. Check in with the show, see what's going on. Maybe you like one of the wrestlers, but you better be there for the last 15 minutes. Well, speaking of people that have been improperly trained and those who maybe need to be potty trained, since we've got a lot of WWE content on the program, we're going to talk about SmackDown, and then later on in, in this show, we're going to talk about Money in the Bank. we got to talk about AEW this past Wednesday night. Boy, howdy. They finally broke you, didn't they? You got no, on there no. and tweeted, John Moxley is the worst wrestler in the world. I That's not exactly what I tweeted. I tweeted a couple of things. At the end of the night, I tweeted, this is one of the worst episodes of AEW Dynamite ever. It's on the short list of the very worst. I tweeted out, John Moxley is one of the worst wrestlers I've ever seen, but I've only been watching since 1989. <laughs> and I did that in reaction to his shitty fucking work in the opening match on this show. And now I'll say, since you brought this up, a lot of people apparently got upset about this. I hear about some other people. I didn't really see it. I don't give a shit. <laughs> if you watch John Moxley, you have to stop lying and admit that you only like the personality he's presenting. Because if you tell me you like his in-ring work, explain that to me. What? Yeah, what is anyone? The, the first match was the plumber, Mr. Moxley, against Ishii. What is anyone pointing to in this match as an example of good? What was done well? What part of professional wrestling was done well in this match, according to anyone? Nothing. I can't imagine. <laughs> I haven't seen anyone specifically point to anything. Everyone's like, oh, what a dumb statement. Anyone who has a problem with it, what a dumb statement to say about, about Moxley. Okay, defend it. He sucks. His promos are ridiculous. His in-ring work looks like shit. His strikes look like shit. He does the most unprofessional shit in front of the camera each and every time. If you told anyone with a brain, tell me what's going to happen in the first 10 minutes of a Moxley Ishii match, they would tell you exactly what it was. They're going to stand there and just hit each other over and over and over again until the audience is beaten into such a submission that they deliriously start reacting to this because it won't end. But wait, you make it sound more, more exciting by the way you described it than it actually was because they were standing there allowing the other to hit themselves, but they weren't actually either being hit or selling anything. 32 chops and six shoulder tackles without anybody selling one or taking a bump. And they all look like shit. Yes, because they don't connect. They're just standing there going through the motion. And then they did 19 of the fake flippy forearms. But did you notice that Moxley was trying to thumb his nose and act like a, a boxer or a fighter in between, and then he'd throw something else that obviously didn't hit the guy, and the guy obviously didn't even react to it? And then they yeah. traded face biting. You know about the face biting, Brian. Yeah. The unmade Rocky film. <clears throat> Rocky Six biting my face. Me and Tyson. And then... Moxley threw him out to the floor and nothing happened. And then finally he dove out on him and then jumped out into the crowd to fire the fans up because he's a heel, right? That must be why he did that. Cause I can't figure out anything else out. You know what? It's so funny. You say that I actually momentarily forgot he's a heel because when he jumped the rail, I'm like, yeah, you know, that's kind of ridiculous in the middle of the match, but he's a baby face. He's trying to get a reaction. He's not a baby face. Yeah. You're right. I forgot all about it. 
Then Ishii laid there on the floor while Claudio and Wheeler Useless surrounded him like they were menacing him, but so, apparently somebody was blowing the music cue. Because finally, Eddie Kingston's music played, and he came out and ran them off. And that was the break spot. And then when they came back, did you notice that Ishii barely pulled off a superplex? The Japanese legends are coming over here and showing their legendariousness by doing the same moves that all these guys on this show already do, but doing them worse. Because they're so beat up. And then they did another forearm trade. Brian, pick a number between 1 and 100. 63. You're 5 off. 58. Many of which didn't land, all of which looked like shit. And then after that, finally, Ishii fell down. But somehow Moxley was bleeding by this point. Was it old gig marks or did he just get juice from air? Did he have juice before the headbutts? Oh, I haven't. No, I'm, I'm, yes, I noted he's bleeding. They haven't done the headbutts oh, yet. I don't know what caused it. I mean, he blades all the time for no reason, but he also isn't working a full time schedule. But I'm sure that scar tissue just from constantly hitting it. Maybe it just opens up from those tight blows from Ishii. Yeah, well, then, but then Moxley got even with him because he got Ishii down. And you know how he does the elbows to the, to the guys, the region of his chest and sternum somehow, bypassing his face, whatever. 14 of those elbows over and over while Ishii flipped him the bird while he was sitting there taking the elbows. And then they traded some moves where they actually sold the moves. They took a bump, and then they would cover and get a one count, and the guy would kick out, and then the other guy do a, they a one. They traded one counts. Then they did the spot where everybody put this on Twitter, making fun of it. They ran at each other and clotheslined each other, but because they were so exhausted, they collapsed in a heap and it looked like two bums trying to keep each other warm in a snowstorm. And that's where the headbutts came in. They stood up and did freestanding headbutts where you don't grab the other guy's head, you, you know, you just back and forth, where you can obviously tell they are not trying to really, they're bonking each other's head just enough to fucking hurt, but it looks phony as shit. And they did 12 of them. So you can tell they're obviously holding back. But that was just for them to get Moxley's blood on Ishii's head so it could look even more grisly. It still looked fake because they weren't really headbutting each other and trying, obviously, to avoid doing that. I wrote, this is the worst televised match in Major League Wrestling promotion history. Uh, then that bunch of two counts and then Moxley hit Rollins as curb stomp. So at least he learned something from his old partners and another double arm suplex that had gotten a two count earlier. And that was one, two, three. And you can tell from the way that Moxley acts and looks after he does these things, you can tell that this Cretan thinks that he's done something remarkable after he has one of these fiascos awful match terrible match his matches are horrible you know for all the complaining you've done about an omega let's say and i haven't oh, been a fan of all of his stuff hey you know I, I gotta be, i gotta be honest i gotta be honest omega blows the plumber away his matches are terrible and the problem is it inundates the entire show but the trading blows you used to call it the one-two. You can't call it that anymore. The trading blows in the middle of the ring nonstop is as lazy as it gets. And it's horrible. Every Moxley match has this shit. Every Moxley match is like, all right, let's do a test of dumbness and do this fucking stupid shit. 
His matches are terrible. Anyone who has a problem with me saying he's one of the worst wrestlers in the world, it's true. Now look, there have been some shitty wrestlers. We've all seen them. But he's pushed as a top guy. Yeah. He's pushed in a top faction in his head. He clearly believes he's a top guy. But his work is awful. And by the way, there are plenty of wrestlers who think that too. It's not just, oh, some knucklehead on a podcast is saying, no, trust me, no, I'm not if, alone. If there, if people were able to speak freely, they would freely speak. That's right. And, and the, the thing is, you know, I hate, and I do hate, despise, loathe, Twinkle Toes for wrestling the Invisible Man and the fucking blow-up doll and the children. I haven't seen Moxley against any sex toys or underage minors or invisible people we can't see, but... Give me a week. The, the concept is still the same. I hate Twinkle Toes for doing that because of the disrespect, the exposing of the business, the making it look silly and phony and jokish. And that's what Moxley's matches do, just in a different way. So, I got... and. At least Kenny looks like an athlete instead of a fucking drunken homeless bum. And I'm sorry that all of these greats from New Japan came over here too late. You know what I mean? Like, I wish there was an AEW bringing all these guys over 10 years ago when they were in their prime or when they could do more. But between Tanahashi and Ishii and Suzuki, Suzuki, I mean, we're seeing too many guys that just... If you're into them, you scream for them. If you're not into them, you have no idea who they are, and they're not impressive. You made a great. You made a great point. Uh, the, the anybody who's making excuses for Moxley or likes Moxley in any way are into the personality that he's portraying rather than what's actually going on in front of them. Yes. Yes. What would be the matter with a motherfucker that liked the personality that he's portraying? A <laughs> rotten looking dim-witted fucking bum that bleeds constantly and stabs people in the head with fucking screwdrivers he it doesn't have great matches do great moves doesn't look great doesn't fuck all the pussy doesn't have all the money oh so what what yeah i want to be some bum covered in scars lose all my hair have a fucking sunken chest and a you know, and sleep in the street. What the fuck? Anyway, all right. And this whole Blackpool combat thing was all his idea. It's the stupidest thing by the week. There's no one from Blackpool. Danielson can't even wrestle right now. No one cares about Yuta. Moxley's just doing the same Moxley stuff. Claudio, I will say, I'm intrigued by Claudio and Eddie Kingston just staring at each other nonstop. I know it's not a match. It's not even a promo. But Claudio's good in that role of standing there and not moving, and just staring at Eddie Kingston while Eddie stares at him. But all this stuff with Moxie's terrible, and I've said it before, cult of personality. Punk has the song, but the real guy in wrestling with the cult of personality is John Moxley. And here's the thing. You may say there's nobody in the group that has anything to do with Blackpool, but I guarantee you I've heard that Moxley leaves a ring around the tub. So... <laughs> All right, MJF and Adam Cole's SUVs suddenly, somehow, coinkadinkily, pulled into the back of the arena at the same time. And there MJF jumps out and congratulates Adam Cole on, on his thinking of getting sick to Miss Forbidden Door, which was, you know, something that MJF should have thought of doing. And, of course, Adam says, I was really sick. And they're... <sighs> Again, now they're taking a side route from establishing MJF as a world champion when he's had no legitimate challengers after Brian Danielson to now do the, the, the funny, unfunny contrast of the two partners that are nothing alike and MJF is going to try to fucking swerve Adam Cole's head around and Cole's probably going to be too smart for it. But basically, and I'm sure we got a video coming up, sounds like an 80s montage to me, because MJF invited Adam Cole to hang out with him over the weekend. Are you looking forward to any of this? I don't know where he's going to take him. Maybe Splish Splash in uh, Suffolk County. You know... Well, now, they were in Hamilton, Ontario. 
here for this. That's true. So where is there to go in Hamilton, Ontario? Uh, Canada's Wonderland is uh, somewhere over there. But, you know, in a way it was, in a way I was just happy to see MJF not do what he's been doing. It was a little bit of a change. I agree that the buddy film kind of stuff and I also thought, okay, here comes the segment where it's like we're out on a town and I have to put up with my friend cheating at pool, whatever the fuck happens. I'm not going to be crazy about that. If Adam Cole actually turns heel and all of a sudden they actually become friends, that may be the best solution for all this. You know what? I would like that if that's the way it ended up. MJF converted him. Yeah. And he becomes a fucking prick just like MJF. Turns on Roddy. Turns on Britt. That could be something. But if it's just going to be Adam Cole's a really sweet, good guy and... He what about if he turns with... on Roddy and then turns on Britt and then Britt and Roddy get together as a couple and MJF gets his attorney to represent Adam Cole in the divorce? Who's going to represent Marina Shafir? Nobody knows her anyway. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> you don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> so so in, in the back, Re- Renee Moxley Good was chewing the plumber out because there he's bleeding. What is his wife thing? He's bleeding again. His fucking sunken chest is heaving. He's blown up. She's chewing him out. What's going on out there? And Kingston comes in. And at this point now, they're just slobbering and yelling at each other. But nobody could tell what they were talking about if you didn't already know that there's some backstory where each of them were friends, but now they're they're mad and... A lot of slobbering is, going yeah, on. This is not what we needed. Again, I know Tony wants to give a lot of these guys leeway, and Moxley likes to do his stuff. Let's go to the back for Renee Moxley Good, and then she's screaming at her husband while his friends are all standing there, and then Eddie Kingston comes up. Like, this is just bad. And you know they all thought this up and thought it was a good idea. This was horrible. Well, speaking of horrible... And folks, we're going to get to the moral of this story because believe me, this week there is one. But the next match was Daniel Garcia, Mac Daddy, and Cool Hand Luke, the Jericho Appreciators, against Keith Lee, Viking O, and Pockets in a six-man tag and entrances to exit 17 minutes. 17. one seven. Almost 20. Then. You didn't watch any of that? Are you out of your mind? It hit me watching this. I think Garcia was better when he was just with 2.0 without Jericho before all that, before him doing his little (laughs) dance and all these things. Doesn't feel like any of that helped him. Weird six man. Again, we can't get away from six man tag matches. Now they're just putting random people together like it's war. Keith Lee, Vikingo, and Pockets. Well, they've all got such, you know, so many things in common, plethora of common interests. It was probably around this period of time, or maybe a little bit after this, where I put out that this was one of the worst episodes of Dynamite ever. It almost felt like they were giving up on the night to me. I think somebody read the format and said, well, Tony gave up, so we might as well also. I know where you gave up. It wasn't this match, because I'm pretty sure you didn't pay any attention to this, but it was the next segment. The buckaroos and hangnail in the back about their trios challenge. They have oh. issued an open trios challenge to anybody that wants to face them. Well, here comes the dork order in. You got Pizzeria Uno leading the charge and speaking for everybody. Again, a fucking giant dumpling clad in pleather. And you got a little Brutus. And you got Alex. Alex was his name. Reynolds. And I thought his last name was was his name. Because that's what every, anytime everybody sees him, they go, what's his name? So they come in and do some bad comedy where Maddie of the Buckaroo said, oh, you guys were on TV. You busted our take. And I went, go ahead, Brandon. Keep rolling. And we'll start again. And he starts trying to do the promo again. This is so staged. It, and basically, here's the crux. They want to accept the challenge because it's more friends having issues. And old Fat Uno said, you abandoned us for them to Hangman. Remember Hangman when he was a drunk loser? Remember last Thursday? 
he was hanging around with the job guys and riding them around on his lawnmower. This happened from the start of the company. Nobody ever cared. Nobody ever wanted to see the dork order when they were an evil heel group or an offbeat babyface group. Nobody cared that Hangnail was their friend. Only the softest of the soft of the Buckaroos fans have ever given a shit about any of this. And it could have easily been replaced with a test pattern. But now we're back to it. After four years, the dork order is mad that Hangnail abandoned them for his other friends, Maddie and Nikki. And there we go. So they're going to have a match later on. Remember that, folks. I tweeted it out, and it may have been later on, but it applies here, so we'll say it here. Have the Young Bucks meant less at any point since they left TNA? Since they were Generation Me? Seriously, because they had a run on the indies and everything that led up to AEW. They're stale right now. There's nothing happening. There's no buzz around them. The fans don't react to them. There's a big difference in the reaction they get when they come out with Omega versus Adam Page, but I don't know. The Bucks feel really stale right now. Well, there's a big difference in the reaction that Ronnie Wood and Charlie Watts got when they came out with Mick. And, uh, you know, that's, again, the 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 difference in, well, I, I don't know if, if the, the Buckaroos, if they have just been overexposed to the point where everybody's seen everything they've got because they don't have that much. It's always the same. And whether people are just bored of it. Or, well, you know, mass hysteria wears off after a while, and so does hypnosis. Anyway, so that match was promoted, and it came up at the top of the 9 o'clock hour. The dork order of Pizzeria Uno, Little Brutus, and Alex was his name against the Buckaroos and Hangnail. And and Hangnail at this point is still a non-entity. The, the most famous and most over he's ever been is when Punk has illustrated how he started this whole thing <laughs> that is probably going to be the thing that led to the ruination of their company when all the histories are written by being a fucking, what was it, an empty-headed dumb fuck that's never done anything in the business and trying to go into business for himself. Dipshit. Dipshit, sorry. Dipshit, dumb fuck. You say tomato, I say fuck you. So the Buckaroos won. They beat the dork order. And then the BBC hit the ring and jumped them. And Moxley stabbed Paige in the head with the screwdriver four times so he could get a pap smear. I guess he's scared of the blade in addition to the other things he's scared of. They beat up the baby faces with chairs and the dork order walked off and left it happen or let it happen nobody else tried to come down and help the heat went on forever moxley slobbered and slurred on the microphone someone should give him a cognitive test i'm afraid the ct is setting in early and he basically says we should finish this by going beyond our limits because that's the cool kind of imagery that he he conjures up with his incredibly compelling promos July 19th in Boston, blood and guts. So we got another fucking five against five garbage match with anything goes and everybody's going to bleed. Boy, that's different. And this rotten fucking match and angle lasted 20 minutes. 20 fucking minutes. So we have had basically 45 minutes count the breaks in the middle of six man tag team matches involving people that shouldn't be on national television. Your thoughts, Brian, this is the problem Tony has when he allows guys to pick who they want to work with and only work with their friends. You get the dork order who no one cares about mixing it up with the bucks and page. The bucks have less buzz than at any point in the last 10, 15 years, Adam page milk toast. And then after that match, which I don't think anyone in the building really seemed to care too much about. You hear from people in the building, they're like, oh yeah, people were into everything. I'm going just based off like reactions. 
Didn't seem like that match had even what Moxley and Ishii had, and that match was awful. And then the BCC run, then again, the screwdriver. Well, now, in all fairness to the Buckaroos, after you see a match like Moxley and Ishii, you wouldn't react to anything. You're just dead inside. Well, speaking of which, Adam Page is a lucky guy that he's not dead. Four times with a screwdriver in the head. <laughs> well, at least, but the thing is, they got him in the head. And as we recall, that's empty. This stuff is terrible, and however hot certain things in AEW are, like a New Japan co-promoted pay-per-view, which does good business, or a Wembley Stadium show that before any matches were announced because of what it is and what it signifies, people were there to see, or people were going to buy tickets to go to see. You can't tell me this stuff with the BCC and the Elite is any good, and that it's doing any good for the company right now. I won't argue with you, but I will say that it was good to see Adam Cole and Roderick Strong back in the back, hugging, still friendly with each other. Adam tells him that he knows he can't trust MJF, and then MJF comes in and tells Roddy, hey, what's up, generic white guy? I see what you're saying about MJF being different. He doesn't have to go out in the ring and yell at the fans yes. on the backstage pre-tapes. He doesn't have to go out and be the devil. He can be the quick-witted, the asides, the snappy repartee and witty banter. Um, I mean, he's entertaining no matter what he's doing. The problem is he's in the middle of this fucking show. But anyway, Adam hugs Roddy and leaves with MJF. Sort of like a fractured romance going on. But here comes, I wanted to see if he could do it, Jungle Jack Perry comes out with a microphone. And I wrote, okay, can he find some personality as a heel? And as soon as he's coming down the aisleway, he said, turn that garbage music off. You're never going to hear that again. So at least Tony's going to save some money on Baltimore. And old Jungle Jack off gets in the ring and he's trying. He's trying to be a heel. At least he's not sleepwalking through things like he was before. And, you know, he's trying to be an obnoxious, self-centered heel. I can see that. He say, hey, I'm, I'm still the one out here banging the hottest bitch in this place because he's fucking Anna Jay, right? Or is that the one? Is it another one? No, it's her. It's okay. I, I couldn't remember who Ty. Ty's with Sammy. Old Ty Melo Conti. She's pregnant with Sammy's baby. Well, at least that's what we have been told. I don't know. I haven't seen the exact test results to oh, confirm come on. that. Leave, leave them alone. Nevertheless, Jungle Jack is trying. He didn't turn on Hook. Everybody turned on him. And because there was that entitled little prick dangling his belt in my face. Here's the thing. I'm not going to knock this. It, it, if he hadn't been so bleh as far as a promo as a baby face, I wouldn't have been thrilled with this because he prepared this for a while. You can tell. He's approaching this like acting. I guess, you know, he grew up around his dad more than he grew up around wrestling. So he's thinking this is acting instead of meaning something, being something. He recited it from memory, but he, it had more oomph to him than he's ever had before, which again is faint praise. So he's better this way. He's not a natural at promos either way, but as a heel, he's much better than a babyface. Would you concur? Say that again? I said he's not a natural at promos either way. Yes. But he's a better heel than he is a babyface. Yeah, and I thought this promos. was and I thought this was a good first start. Look, Britt Baker's first heel promo was one of the worst things ever on the show. Woohoo! What she, and, and and she got completely See, she wasn't rehearsed enough. She twisted in the wind, got completely lost and flummoxed there. This one, the reason why I take points off was because it didn't seem spontane spontaneous. It was prepared. It was recited, but it had more oomph than his normal bleh. Came out there with the ponytail, with the jacket. Should never take the sunglasses off. Keep them on. That helps. Yeah. yeah. You know what else? Instead of saying, I'm banging the hottest bitch here. She should be out there with him. Why waste that? First yes. of all, first of all, unless you're an inside fan, you don't even know who he's talking about. 
You don't Truth. even know who he's talking about. She's out there making all of her fucking faces. She's willing to take stupid bumps. She's good looking. She's athletic. Get her out there. She could save him. Well, and, and think about this, Sammy. They loved Sammy until he showed up with Ty and that bitch face. It got him instant heat. This way, it would be on purpose. They would want him to have heat. If you've got a pretty girl and you're a little douchebag prick like he is, that gets you heat. Exactly. Go out there, keep yeah. the sunglasses on, act like a prick, act like you're better than everyone. Again, the reasoning for why he doesn't like Hook didn't exactly add up. Although there is something funny about him saying, I don't like second generation people who have just been handed things. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's part of the, the humor of it, though. But get him out. Instead of him saying he's banging the hottest bitch, she should be out there strutting her stuff with him. Let him get the heat of the fact that so many people wish they were banging the hottest bitch. Yeah. Because otherwise, she's just wrestling random matches on Rampage. And then here came Hook at the appropriate time, and he ran out, slid in, and chased Jungle Boy out of the ring and back to the parking garage, and then I'm pretty sure that they pre-taped it. But Jungle Boy was running, and Hook was on his tail, and there's the limousine or the SUV or whatever the fuck, the back door is open, and he dove headfirst into that fucking thing, did Jungle Boy, and boom, it takes off before Hook can get there. That was perfect. However, for two reasons. Number one, minorly, for me, with my background in TV production, I would have said, we can't have you look like an idiot on live TV, so we need to pre-tape that and get it right because you got to dive in that thing. But secondly, if you noticed, Brian, Tony Schiavone killed it because as he's running, Tony said, he better dive in that thing head first, and then that's exactly what he did. So I think Tony was there when they shot it earlier in the day, and he gave it a fucking way. Well, it's important to note Tony Schiavone's horrible on commentary in 2023, and he's just there because people like him. Well, yeah, but you wouldn't have given that away in 1983. I agree. Why would he do that? Anyway, Ruby Soso beat Alexia Nicole. And apparently Alexia took Britt Baker's place because she was sick, which makes sense if Adam Cole was breathing on her or getting his, any kind of his DNA on all over her. He was sick last week, you'll recall. I don't know if that transfers whatever illness he had. Well, you know, germs and microbes. Oh, well, that's you know true. about that's the microbes true. and the microbiomes and the gut health and all that. We're going to be talking about a lot of that stuff again in a couple of weeks, boy. We've got... Gut health? Interesting stories. All, all the gut health and the manscaping and the crotch rot and all your favorite stories will be back in a couple of weeks, fans. This promo <laughs> that uh, Ruby did afterwards was very long and the people were tired of all this shit by then. And then, uh, <sighs> go ahead. I'm just going to reiterate what I've been saying. Tony Storm, on her own as a heel, she does really good heel promos. She's good in the ring. She's being wasted, being tied down by Soraya. And, you know, no disrespect to Ruby, but I don't think that helps Tony. Tony on her own right now is great. That's so you're a saying you're saying if a filet mignon cooked perfectly was covered up with peanut butter and anchovies, it might ruin the flavor of the steak, too. Well, it depends on the chef, I guess is what I'm saying. It depends on the chef. And if you've had it already and you know that the chef sucks, you may not want to have that same meal again. You may want to have... Filet mignon, the good old-fashioned way, the way that draws money. With a little Oscar sauce on the top. Oscar from Men on a Mission? Yeah. We're on a mission. They, the boys used to blister poor Oscar. They'd say, we're on assistance. <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> well, he had, come, he had come from nothing outside the wrestling industry. All right, they had a VTR from Rampage of the QTV girl telling... Anthony Bowens have acclaimed that she thought that he was into her and him telling her that he's gay. And that is pissed off QT Marshall of QTV and his QTV girl who've now got John Morrison there who is now going to be Johnny TV. So there, another good talent you might want to see, but now not. 
they're going to ruin him too. You know, one of the real positives has been the fact that the Acclaim got over his top baby faces, the fact that the Acclaim have been accepted by fans, and the fact that Anthony Bowens is a gay man has not been an issue. It's been something the fans have been cool with. I mean, they chanted during that segment, was it he is gay? I mean, they were with him. But if you're going to do something like that, an angle like that, why are you wasting that on QT and his crew? Yeah. That's something you can get some publicity for. That's something that's a really cool moment. The fans are showing that they're progressive, at least in terms of everyone being equal. Really cool. Why waste that on Rampage? Well, and also with QT with every, and this girl. With everything that's going on in the world, with the laws and the Supreme Court that's infested with conservatives and religious fanatics, as we knew it was going to be whenever we elected Republicans to pick these lifetime appointments for these unqualified idiots that are going to send us back to the Stone Age. Everywhere else, people are over the whole gay thing. They're not scared of gay people in the bathroom. They're scared of, like, uh, this screwy weather we're having. An extinction-level event, to me, trumps goddamn gay people in the bathroom. I'm more nervous about being extinct. So people have moved past that, and now it's instead of the heel being the person you want to chant to you're gay, the babyface is the person that's gay, and the heel is the person that is not wanting the gay person to be gay. So then lean into that. And fucking make the goddamn heel. I'm going to get rid of this gay shit going on and keep him well, no, out of my kid's bathroom. No, you can't do that. You couldn't well, do that. Well, why not? Because that would cause more problems than it why would be worth. Why couldn't the heel come out and say, Bowens, fuck you. You ain't coming in my goddamn kid's bathroom. Because they would get kicked off the air right away. Bowens could say, well, I don't give a fuck. I'm going to go to your kid's bathroom and I'm going to rescue him from you because probably you're not even his real father because you're a fucking fornicator and you've been fucking around all over town and so is your no good whore of a wife. See, turn it right back around. Yeah, I don't don't know if any of that would work at all. But again, if they're going to do this with Bowens, why waste it on a Friday show? Why waste it on QT and his crew? If it was even if it was Maria Canellis that came up to him and you did that on a Wednesday. There you go. But why waste this? Again, Fuck, the, I forgot Bennett and Taven are there. They have a good tag team in this company. They just never show them to us. We just never every now and then you mention them and then we don't see them on TV. <laughs> Wait a minute. Shh. In that case, edit out that I mentioned their names. <laughs> All right, are we ready for the main event? Because <sighs> bless, bless him, bless him. Poor Sting. Darby Allen and Sting against Sammy Guevara and the Pain Maker. Is it is that referring to the pain that all of us feel in the pit of our stomach when we realize that Jericho has another self-centered gimmick he's going to pawn off on us? He creates pain for hotel workers all throughout the land. Hey, Derek. As soon as he walks in. Well, if you're in the service industry, folks, and you see a guy with a fucking floppy black hat... <laughs> and makeup on his face with a a kabuki mask on and spiky things coming out of his pleather jacket, run. He's not going to be happy with his service. Every day is Halloween for the cosplay crowd, and it's a tornado match, all four in the ring, anything goes. The only rule is the match has to to end in the ring. Somebody's got to get pinned in the ring. Imagine that. It's their first tag team match these four people have ever had. Right? Uh, I don't know if we've seen them they in a just tag team it match. Was, no. it, was, yeah. it was Jericho and fucking Sting the first time they were yeah, in the ring. Yeah, we just got the six-man match. That's right. Yes, That's right. it's the first tag team match these four fucking lunatics have ever had, and it's Tornado Tag, all four in the ring, anything goes. So they started with Darby and Sammy fighting on the floor while in the ring Jericho and Sting stood there and trash-talked each other. And then Jericho poked Sting with his baseball bat So Sting walked over and got his bat, and they did the bat fencing thing. Clank, clank, clank. And after two weak gut shots, they both dropped their bats, and it turned into a four-way without bats. Brian, when's the last time you got in a fight with a fucking bat and decided, well, you know what? I'm going to drop this son of a bitch and just go mano a mano rather than cave this motherfucker's head in with a bat. You never drop the bat. Never. 
No, as a matter of fact, goddamn, I regretted I threw a bat one time and missed my target and then didn't have the bat anymore. I lost control of myself. The move is you have to have other equipment in your trunk. So when the cops say, why do you have this bat? You go, well, I also have this baseball glove and this softball and this basketball. Well, but I was pepper sprayed at the time and I've, I couldn't catch Terry Landell. So I sidearmed the bat <laughs> at him, but he hopscotched it and went behind a car. Sidearmed? Side armed, yeah, because well, like see, helicopter. You mean like a helicopter throw? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the thing is, I was going to try to take him around the midsection of the legs. So whoosh, 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 rather than throwing it up and down, then if he just dodges one foot to the left or right, it's gone. But if you can get that thing spinning sideways, you've got a three three foot radius. Anyway, <laughs> so this match, Sammy pulled out a ladder. And they fought on the floor with the chairs and they did some stunts with the stairs and they went to a break in this chaos with eight minutes left on the air. And I'm thinking, well, what the fuck? And of course they're running behind because of all this other shit they've had on the show that went way too long. You can't mean to tell me they scripted that scripted. I said it now. Well, this is phony that they formatted that one six man tag for 17 minutes on purpose. They just wouldn't leave. So anyway, they come back, they got five minutes left on the air. And Jericho and Sting are fighting in the arena, and Sammy gives Darby a springboard cutter off the barricade. And I wrote this as an indie mess with two of the most accomplished veterans currently still active in the business involved in it. It is degenerated into outlaw garbage. And then Darby came off the top rope to the floor with a coffin drop, which missed Jericho and almost missed Sammy, and he crashed to the floor back first, basically going, he didn't go in between him because Jericho just said fuck it as he went on by and watched him. But Sammy really did try to break his fall, but it didn't work. So, then Darby and Sting pull out tables, and they take forever to set both of them up, and Darby in trying to kick the leg out and, and make the leg stable, broke one of the legs on his table. And Taz pointed it out. Not sure if Darby wants to use that table. The leg is broken because Taz knows furniture. He worked ECW. And he was, he was like trying to send it out by telepathy. Can you hear me, idiot? Get another table or don't do this. So then... Darby sets the ladder up, the big ladder in the ring. They've got two tables side by side on the floor. Darby gets in the ring, sets a ladder up. At this time, I wrote, where did their opponents go? Where did Jericho and, and Sammy go if they're that incapacitated that they're laying on the ground immobile while these guys set two tables up, then the other guy gets in the ring and sets a ladder up and then climbs up the ladder? Why not just beat them? Why go through this whole fucking erector set? Why do we have to see this shit all the fucking time? So Sammy takes forever with the ladder. Sting puts, or not Sammy, but Darby. Sting puts Sammy on the tables. And Darby has climbed the ladder. But Sting climbs the other side of the ladder and says, let me do it. Now, if I could just say, at this point, it was clear that even for Darby, that was a hell of a jump he would have to make. It was too fucking far. It was clear as day. It was like when I saw Brock try to do the shooting star press at WrestleMania that year. Because he's too fucking far. It's too fucking far. So, Sting climbs up and says, let me do it. And Darby, after they talk about, oh, Really? Yes, indubitably. Oh, indubitably? Yes, really. Then you do it, Stanley. <laughs> and so Darby climbs down and Sting turns around and Sammy's still laying on that fucking table. Those tables. And Taz is saying, it's too far away. He'll never make it. And Sting, he's not on the top of the ladder because he's 60 fucking four and he's got some sense. He's four or five rungs down, but it's still, it's in the ring. So from the ground, he's got to be his feet or 12 feet up. And he fucking takes off and tries to splash Sammy through both of these tables. Now, as you will recall, the far one has a broken leg on it. 
the leg is not connected to the table anymore. It's propped up right, but it, there's no bracket connecting it. So as soon as anybody wiggles it, it's going to collapse. But fortunately, I say for Sting, he didn't get there anyway. He was not only short, but he was two feet to the left. Instead of splashing Sammy on top of both tables, his face came down onto Sammy's knee. And the rest of Sting fell short, and he broke the first table because there was enough weight on the first table. The second table just slowly collapsed and turned over when that leg gave way because Sammy was still laying on it because only part of this thing broke. But the point is, when Sammy or when Sting landed with his face and chest on Sammy's knee and legs and the edge of the table, he knocked his fucking tooth out, apparently. At least that's what he said on social media later on, and you see him instantly grabbing his mouth and checking his teeth. But here's what would have happened if he hadn't knocked his own tooth out by coming up short. Brian, the table closest to him broke in half as it was supposed to. The other table probably wouldn't have broken in half because if enough motion and force came down on it, it would have caused that table with one broken leg to collapse on one side and one side would have been standing up while the other side would have been flat down. If Sting had landed on both of those and broke one but the other one went sideways and he's already splashing a motherfucker that's just been bent down into that table, I say that by physics it would have bent Sting backwards at a 45 degree angle on his spine in the direction he's not supposed to bend naturally and broke his back. What do you think? There was no good ending. I mean, it was clear from the moment he started climbing the ladder, he's jumping off a ladder. He's not even jumping off the ropes. Jumping off a ladder, and it was too far away. There was no good ending. This is the guy that a few years ago we were talking about how sad it was his career ended because of a buckle bomb. Yes. A buckle bomb. And he did this here. You say he knocked out his tooth. Looked like he may have cut his. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it looked like there was some blood. Oh yeah, well, you yes, know, un, under his uh, under his jaw. I'm sure it it either uh, uh, cut his chin open or cut his lip open. Or I can tell you from experience, when you get a tooth knocked out, there's some blood accompanying said tooth. And you know what? When you see Sting and you know he's hurt, it's not like seeing Sting 30 years ago and knowing he's hurt. Now you know he's an old guy and he's hurt. It makes the match a little awkward to watch. But again, I, why do you want to? I mean, he wants to because he wants to hang with the kids, and I'm sure their enthusiasm is, is infectious for him, and he's making seven figures a year. But God damn, don't allow him to do that. Discourage it, if not outright forbid it. What is the use? <clears throat> anyway, continuing on, they're out of the fucking picture now. Darby comes off the top rope with a skateboard onto Jericho's back and gets a two count. And then Jericho hits Darby with a ladder twice. But fortunately, Darby's not injured because he reverses an arm whip and runs Jericho into the ladder. Then Jericho hits Darby with a skateboard and the Judas elbow. Darby falls to the floor. Sting comes back in the ring. And, and Jericho gets the walls of Jericho on Sting. And then it was 10 o'clock and my DVR froze. What the fuck happened? They had two minutes of overrun, and finally... Purposely, or because they were unable to get the goddamn thing in on time? I don't know, because again, uh, a lot of things seem like they went a long time, but also the match that was going to be Britt Baker's match went really short. You have to think that would have gone longer if Britt Baker was here. I don't know how any of that throws off the time, but two-minute overrun. Well, what happened? I don't remember. Well, good. And nobody else does either. Because according to the ratings, nobody wanted to see this thing, or if they had wanted to see the main event, they were discouraged by the two hours of treachery, deceit, and torture that came before it. You're saying it. Let's go to the ratings quickly, and then we will uh, move ahead to SmackDown. The ratings, AEW Dynamite, June 28th, Wednesday night. 
809,000 viewers on average, and it's the lowest total viewership since May 3rd, and it's the lowest in the key demo 18 to 49 since June 24th, 2020, three years oh. ago. Well, it's, it's, it, but it was their anniversary. Did they have a rotten show three years ago this week? Uh, I am not exactly sure. Now, the NHL draft was on the same night. All right, you got that all-night gas station opened up down the road. How are you going to compete with that? Well, let's go to the quarter hours. Here they are. Once again, June 28th, AEW Dynamite on TBS. 8 to 8.15 p.m., quarter one. These are compiled by WrestleNomics. Tomohiro Ishii versus mm -hmm. John Moxley with Picture in Picture. 943,000 viewers. Okay. They started at 9.43. Let's see where they finish up. And let's see how many people this thing ran off in the first 15 minutes. Segment two. 8.15 to 8.30 p.m. Continuation of Ishii versus Moxley with Eddie Kingston. Uh, yeah, that's what it says. With Eddie Kingston's involvement. MJF and Adam Cole's backstage angle. Moxley and Kingston and Renee's backstage angle. And a Will Ospreay Kenny Omega video. 909,000 viewers. Well, that is considerably better than I thought they do. They only lost 34,000. Oh, wait, there's more. 8.30 to 8.45 p.m., quarter three, El Hijo del Vikingo. Oh, boy. And Keith Lee. Oh, boy. And Orange Cassidy versus Daniel Garcia, Matt Menard, and Angelo Parker with picture in picture. 835,000 viewers. Gee, okay, now we start seeing the exodus, the lemmings dropping off the cliff. There's another 74,000 people. Now they've lost, in the first 45 minutes, 108,000 viewers. But again, the NHL draft was on, and that's a big night for all those hockey-loving wrestling fans. Segment 4, 8.45 to 9 p.m., the finish of the previous six-man tag match. The Elite's backstage angle with the Dark Order. Chris Jericho's promo. And the beginning of the Elite versus the Dark Order. 808,000 viewers. And off go another 27,000. Bringing our total that we've lost now to 135,000 people. And they're going to the top of the hour with that shitty buckaroos match. But wait, there's more. Top of the hour, the big 9 o'clock hour, 9 to 9, 15 p.m. Continuation of the Elite versus Dark Order with Picture in Picture and the post-match angle with the Blackpool Combat Club and Eddie Kingston. 783,000 <sighs> viewers. So they lost at the top of the hour 25,000 more people with who are allegedly some of their main event individuals in the ring competing. Segment five, nine, uh, no, segment six, excuse me. That's right, it's his overrun. Segment six, 9.15 to 9.30 p.m. John Moxley's live promo, Samoa Joe, Dustin Rhodes, and Ricky Starks' videos, MJF Cole and Roderick Strong's backstage confrontation, and Jungle Boy's promo, with Hook running out, 762,000 viewers. Jeez, another 21,000. They are down now 181,000. Segment 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. Sammy Guevara's entrance with Picture in Picture. Ruby Soho versus Alexia Nicole. Ruby's live promo. And QTV's backstage promo, 711,000 viewers. Oh, and 51,000 more people just said, fuck this, I'm out of here. And finally, and I remind you, we have overrun numbers. And finally, 9.45 to 10 p.m., Darby Allen and Sting versus Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara with picture in picture, 720,000 viewers. Two-minute overrun, 810,000 viewers. <laughs> so 90,000 people came to see what else was on. What program normally starts at 10 o'clock? I am not sure. 
Well, it must have a devoted audience, but basically they could, with Sting and Jericho in the ring, they could only get 9,000 people back of the 120. No, I'm sorry. In Seg 7, they had lost 132,000, and Jericho and Sting got 9,000 of them back. And then suddenly 90,000 other people showed up at 10 o'clock. Boy, howdy. But they you can't say that was unexpected. Look at that program and look at the it, it's starting to be a cumulative effect at this point, also, because the shows the last several weeks have been stinkers on Wednesday nights. You know, this is gonna start affecting both shows too, because if for the most part, the only thing collision has going for it is that CM Punk's gonna be there. And Wednesday night's falling apart because look at what it is. This is why the brand split, whatever you want to call it, doesn't work for AEW. You need all hands on deck to make these shows acceptable. Yeah, they're and, bad. and even then, if if Wednesday sucks, why do people why should they suspect that Saturday will be better if they've been seeing this from this company? You know, yes, the punk fans will check it out, but everybody else goes, well, it's gonna be more of the same. And, you know, meanwhile, the WWE, WWE runs away with the viewers with one interesting thing in fucking two or three hours. And that's different in terms of how you establish, you know, Roman will be on SmackDown. Whenever he's there, he's going to be there unless they announce he's on Raw. If you're a casual AEW fan, whatever that means, I guess one of the, you know, 700,000 people that don't buy the pay-per-views, I guess that would maybe be a casual fan. What do you know about Punk? Do you know that Punk's only going to be on one show? Are you tuning in frustrated every week expecting Punk on Dynamite and there's no Punk? Because it's not really said, he's only available on Saturdays. Nothing's being said. They're handling that wrong, too. And they're, they've taken so much off Punk already, and it just continues. Yeah, they they managed to. It's, it's like I said about Shitstain a long time ago. They don't get people over, they get people under. They manage to take people that the fans are interested in and diminish or devalue or damage them to the point where that they're not as interested as they used to be. Or the matches or the stipulations. How many times can you say, oh, we're going to cut this guy's head off with a chainsaw? Well, that's great the first few times. Not for the guy whose head's being cut off, but for the people watching. But after you've seen a guy get his head cut off with a chainsaw about seven or eight times, Ain't that many different ways you can do it. No. Well, that was AEW Dynamite, another horrid episode, one of the worst episodes ever, just worthless. How'd you really feel? I liked it. Okay. Is it time yet, Brian, to layeth the smacketh down? The smacketh down? Thuffer and fuck attack. Well, Daffy, I think so. Oh boy, are they going to do this again this next coming week where they have wrestling every night of the week? All right. So SmackDown on June 30th was in London, England. Uh, the infamous Lord Fog was menacing Batman. Did you ever see that episode of Batman with Lord Fog? I have, it yes. Rudy Valley with the pipe <laughs> that emitted the fog that blinded everyone. It was, it was wonderful. In Londinium. Who's your favorite guest star on the old Batman show? Um, oh, got favorite. Now you've, now you've scared it out of me, as Mama Cornette used to say. How can you... What'd you think of Liberace? How can you narrow it down? Liberace was good, but I always, I had a soft spot when I was a kid for King Tut, Victor Bueno. <laughs> Very good. Because he was, he was only a criminal against his will, the head injury. <laughs> you know, many times he yeah. wouldn't even remember when he came to his senses that he had been evil. Nevertheless, Listen, speaking of... No one was talking about CTE back then. That's true. He was an early example. They should have known every time he got hit in the head, he turned to a life of crime. <laughs> we got to talk about SmackDown, don't we? So We do, we do. So the they were in Londinium, merry old London, and uh, the opening match for the tag team title was Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens against Purely Deadly because basically... They put the belts on Sammy and Kevin, and after they got finished with the bloodline, they don't have anything lined up for them that matters where the shit. And I'm, it, I invoke the purely deadly rule. 
which is not a fucking chance I'm watching this shit, right? And especially because by the time they were done, it was 20 minutes into the show. Could, could it be because the, I guess they're purely deadly or the hometown boys over there, right? Or at least hometown. I'm not sure about boys. I can't say. Every time I assume someone's from over there, I get yelled at that. No, they're from Australia. New Zealand. From Ireland. You're an idiot. Yeah, the Isle of Malta. <laughs> they got the same accent over there. But then the next match was for the United States title being defended in London with an American against another folk. Uh, uh, is, is, is Where are the brawling brutes from? They're English, right? Well, no, Seamus, he's Irish. He's Irish. But then Ridge Holland and Butch. Ridge Holland is Welsh, isn't he? Oh, God damn, now there's another country heard from. Or am I wrong? Boom, see, I got to use that in the right context. <laughs> um, well, at least Butch is, he. where was Charles Dickens born? Because little in urchin Butch is from his home area, right? Well, anyway, they're they're more popular over there than Austin Theory is. And we're just going to be silly about this, I guess. Ridge, it, well, we get, till we get to the bloodline. Oh, he's not He's not Welsh. He's from huh? Todd Morton, which is in the upper Calder Todd Valley. Todd Morton? He from, wasn't really related to Ricky. He just pretended to be his nephew. He's from a town called Todd Morton. <laughs> <laughs> now he was from Springfield, Kentucky, as I remember. At least he lived there for a while. All right. Well. So, so where we were talking about Austin Theory against Todd Morton. No, Austin Theory against Ridge Holland. And now I was trying to pay the man a compliment. One of these individuals, Ridge looks great physically. He had the UK colors on his gear, wherever part of it he's from, all that United Kingdom over there. And it, 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 he's built, he's in shape, he's jacked. But from from the neck down, from the neck up, the haircut makes him look like a fucking Marine recruit from 1962. It just, it's, I don't know. He doesn't, he needs something, a longer hair, something on the face. I don't know. A third eye. A blood bubble? Any, blood bubble. Anyway, uh, he's another one of these guys that shows his strength great in a wrestling context. You could be a great bench presser but if you can't it's because part of its strength and part of its natural balance and you can't teach that um and of course austin theory as we know is our our boy and so i'm thinking well i'm gonna watch this right and theory healed stop him cut him off pretty quick and did a throat chop I, and uh, that's the only thing I can describe it as. And then in kind of a half-ass way, jerked, grabbed his arm and jerked Ridge's throat over the top rope. And Ridge kind of staggered back. He did his rolling drop kick and covered him. One, two, three. In two fucking minutes. I was like, and and there's Ridge Holland down selling his throat like he was shot. And... If theory tries to get a little more heat and here comes our boy Seamus and theory powders out no contact. And I'm like, well, that was interesting. Did, uh, did Ridge piss in somebody's post toasties that morning? Well, it just beat him in two fucking minutes. Well, remember this does in a sense tie into what happened to him. The last time we saw him solo Sokoa beat up a generic bald wrestler in the back and we found out it was Ridge Holland. I didn't even realize he had hair. I just remembered him as a bald guy. In the back. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah. So he's selling his throat. Remember, Solo hit him with a spike in the back, and he was oh, so geez. injured that Sheamus wrestled Solo. We still haven't seen Ridge go against Solo. Instead, he got beat by Austin Theory. Couldn't he have protected his fucking throat for a little more than two minutes before he got beat flat in the middle of the fucking ring, being toasted, dusted, and done, or done and dusted, as they say over there? All right. Um, did you love Bailey against Shotzi? You know, my fast forward button got stuck. Uh-huh. During this match, I couldn't stop it. And then it well, stopped after this somehow. Apparently, then it, it didn't take you long to fix it because Bailey won in three minutes. That was it. 
And then after the break, they had a fake fight in the back with Bailey and EO. And they took a pair of scissors and cut a big chunk of Shotzi's green hair out. Big long piece. So apparently this will this blood feud will continue. And by that point, we were at the nine o'clock hour. Boy, this show was just flying by, sort of like a fucking crippled snail with polio. And we cut that the nine o'clock hour. Please tell me that nobody in that company is convinced that this Grayson Waller effect is either a ratings draw, quality television programming, or a good way to start off the top of your hour. I can't say if they're convinced of that. I think they are convinced that Grayson Waller is going to be a star for them, and that's why we're seeing him... Then give him a show! Don't give him a show that makes people sick of him because it's so fucking silly and stupid, and then expect him to become a star from that. Wait, if he becomes a star first, then he can be silly and stupid. That's a rule, by the way. Hey, here's the thing. Well, I'll I'll save it for the for the uh, money in the bank business. But anyway, so the the fake graphics and the goofiness of the appearance of the potted plants and the set and the ring and the whole nine yards. But he's got Logan Paul. And I thought, now I'm conflicted. Do I watch for Logan Paul or ignore this ridiculous Grayson Jobber? So I was listening in the background. I didn't necessarily have to watch it, but I'm wondering how long till all the other Money in the Bank guys come out to have the fight, because we know that's what's going to happen here. That's right. And at least then I didn't have to look at the fake graphics because our severe weather crawl locally covered those up. And then... <laughs> Do they know Logan Paul? Is Logan Paul as big a deal in London and the UK as he is over here to our Twitter mad populace? I think the people that like him or don't like him aren't just domestic. They're all around the world. Well, but I mean, he, he might get he's known. I think he's known. I think they know who he is. He's yeah. known, but he probably gets more publicity here in this country where he spends most of his fucking time, you know. You would think, but... Shit. But that is a tabloid culture, so I can't say that for certain. Well, then it's up in the air. But regardless, they didn't. He, he didn't seem. It didn't seem like the people cared about him as much as they do here when he was just first talking. Um, but then again, as soon as L.A. Knight comes out, they go ballistic for him. So they know what's going on with the television programs. I don't know. Maybe they were just. They don't want to hear Logan talk to Grayson, but L.A. Knight comes out five seconds after his name was mentioned, and all of his shit gets over. He talks his way to the ring, and the people do, um, you know, his thing, yeah, or L.A. Knight, or whatever he wants them to do. And then when Logan Paul starts talking back to him, now they got into it a little bit. Did you notice that? It was like at least maybe it was just something they wanted to be interested in besides the other guy. Based on the pop that LA Knight got, the pops he continues to get, the pop he got the next night, the disappointment. Well, we don't want to say too much about the next night, but the fact that LA Knight is getting this reaction, I think a lot of those fans were waiting for him to come out and they were hoping he would come out and then they got him and they popped for it. And then as they're chanting for LA Knight and he's face to face with Logan Paul, they play old Pablo Escobar's music and out here. And I said, well, that's over. And then they, he does a little bit of a promo and then here comes Butch. They ought to team up Butch and pockets and a be if, if Anoki and Baba were still alive and could do one more of those joint wrestling summit deals, they could have Butch and pockets team up. I actually like Butch here. Just running in there, and he was the only one who didn't care about a mic. He just wanted to jump in there and start the brawl. Well, yes, but the problem was he's the one that tackles Logan Paul. And the stars in here were Logan Paul and L.A. Knight. I'd like to see a little more of that. The Butch tackles Logan Paul, and they get in a fight for 10 seconds. Oh, oh my God, I see you. We're going to break. It was, uh, if, if they're playing a fucking network, television football game and suddenly both teams get in a goddamn 
hey rube on the field and everybody's swinging at everybody do they say well now's a good time to tell you about ford trucks so anyway they come back from the break and there is a match in progress you'll never guess what it is ladies and gentlemen a triple threat match <laughs> L.A. Knight against Escobar against Butch with Logan Paul at ringside. And a uh, good God. And again, L.A. Knight, people love him. He was great. But it was 100 miles an hour. You know, it moves to each other back and forth. And people clearly, you know, were behind L.A. Knight, who nominally in, in this scenario is usually the heel. And it... it so when... It, if L.A. Knight is inhabiting the heel role and the things that happened to him happened to him, it would be more palatable if he wasn't so fucking popular. But anyway. I don't, uh, think, finally, he, I, I don't think you can consider him the heel. I mean, you say the heel role. Well, Logan Paul's the heel. He was the first guy to come out there to confront him. Well, yes, but he has been somewhat, he's been presented as the heel on the heel side or work against baby faces. And Butch is a baby face and Escobar is a baby face. Well, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And so obviously he's slowly switched. But the problem is when a guy's getting this popular as a heel, Stone Cold Steve Austin, as long as you don't, don't continue to beat him like a drum or deny him opportunities, he tends to get over even more. But anyway, where's I'm going with this? L.A. gets face-to-face -face with Logan Paul out on the floor, and the people come to their feet, and then Escobar dives out and decks Logan Paul and rolls back in the ring, and Butch hits his finish on him, one, two, three, and the whole thing went four minutes. And I'm like, okay, Jesus Christ. And then Butch gets the ladder and goes to climb and get the case. But L.A. Knight jerks him down, big pop, climbs, but there's Logan Paul pulls him down and climbs and then Butch stops him and climbs and Butch gets the case. You couldn't even have LA Knight outsmart everybody at the end of Butch one. Yes. I know he's from Liverpool or Puddlingham or wherever the fuck he's from over there. He's the hometown boy. But if Butch gets to win the match, then have LA Knight outsmart everybody and get the case. Uh... Can I ask you a question about LA Knight? Because, you know, we it's now an unavoidable thing. Yes. Everyone from smart fans to casual fans has been talking about this and paying attention. And obviously people who are going and they're going in droves are popping for him. When you hear that WWE may be reluctant to go too far with him because of his age, do you think that makes sense in this day and age or not? And based on the little bit of time you spent around him, I guess, an impact, is he the kind of guy you think could do press, can do morning shows and stuff? I mean, he seems really... Yes. He's, he, he's quick. He's glib. He's got a, a, an attitude of the way he carries himself that he's somebody. He's got the fucking both as a heel and as a baby face. He's got that natural, you know, a delivery where it doesn't sound like he's just scripted or pulling this shit from memory. And he can work. He's animated in the ring. And and you he draws your attention to the shit that he's doing. And again, the age thing, my God, he have you ever heard of him having a serious injury? Or being out for any extended period of time? You like the headlines on everybody else. So and so will be out for fucking three years. Their uterus fell out. He's reasonably injury-free, doesn't wear any heavy braces. I haven't heard of him having a lot of surgeries. I haven't read his medical records. But And how much older physically does, for example, the Hardys, who are still early to mid-40s, right? Mid-40s? I believe so. How much different does there appear to be physically between the way that L.A. Knight moves at, is he 38 or 39 or 40? And guys five, six, seven years older. Well, it appears just on the limited time I've watched him in NXT and here, he works a lot smarter than a lot of guys who may be his age and have done a lot more... You think? Extreme stuff. Yes. So that's what... Why would you not... Okay, well, <laughs> we don't have a lot of people on the roster that people, the fans, react to to this level. So for two or three years, we'll take a chance on this senior citizen. 
that when he's 43, he might not already be confined to an iron lung. Moving on. For the WWE women's title, one of them, Charlotte took on Oscar with Bianca at ringside. And ladies and gentlemen, as you will recall, when last we left Frothingham Falls, the Widow Flair had come back to challenge the evil, bitchy lady down the street, Oscar, for the title, but screwed Bianca, the school marm, out of her chance, and Bianca's not happy about that, right? So I'm thinking, I love Charlotte. You love Oscar. I'll watch this match. And so I did. And by the way, it's not that I don't like Charlotte. I think Charlotte's great too, usually. Well, yes, but you've fallen over. Slobber might be more. No, I point out that Oscar's a very talented professional wrestler. Uh huh. And Drool, while no, you... this isn't a Dave and Kenny situation. I point out that Oscar's very talented. All right. Anyway, so they opened up hot. Charlotte looks amazing, and they went two minutes to the break. And I'm like, I got Newman. So then they come back, and Charlotte's in control for like 10 seconds, and then misses a moonsault, and they start going into their finish. And they get a couple of two counts. And Charlotte, guilty also, even though I love her, did the blind moonsault off the top where she just trusts that the opponent will still be in the same place that they were 45 seconds previously. However, in this case, she missed Oscar, went right past her, but Oscar fell anyway. And then they went out to the floor. Charlotte throws a kick at Oscar. Oscar moves. Charlotte kicks Bianca. Oscar throws Charlotte back in, and Bianca attacks Oscar. Not the woman who kicked her, but the other one. And ding, 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 they ring the bell, and, and they had not been back from the break for three minutes. So this was just like a little angle. And then Bianca clears off the desk, gets in a fight with Charlotte, and then Bianca grabs Oscar and gives her her finish on the desk. And that is not a finish that even looks good, given it's somebody on the desk, right? And it's not like the desk is breaking under their immense weight to begin with. And then she grabs Charlotte and gives her the goddamn finish on the desk on top of Frick or Frack, whichever one it was. Why did the girls have to do desk spots? Save it for the main event fucking guys. Instead, uh, And we'll talk more about that when the women's money in the bank match comes up. But, you know, this was, yeah... What'd you think? I thought it was all right. I, during this match, went back to my thing for the last few months. I don't think Charlotte is placed well as a babyface. She's too good as a heel to use her as a lukewarm babyface. Well, I'm not sure now that she is, because Bianca's right. Charlotte did come uh, butt in front of her in line, but at the same time, is Bianca the heel now? Because she just laid both these girls out on the goddamn ringside table, or since the people like it because there's a piece of furniture involved, does that mean that anybody that slams somebody through furniture has to be the baby face by default? See, these are the things that keep me up at night. Anyway, it's time for our main event. At 9.40 Eastern Standard Time, Roman Reigns, Solo, and Paul Heyman uh, began making their way to the ring. And after their entrance, a commercial break, the plugs, et cetera, et cetera, Roman spoke his first word at 9.49 p.m. <laughs> Nine minutes for, to get them to the ring and get the microphone in their hand and hear a syllable. But anyway, this was the big go-home promo for the bloodline issue for Money in the Bank, which, as everybody knows is, the, knows, is the only reason that people have been sitting through a lot of the other parts of these programs is to see what the fuck's going to happen. And Roman basically did the promo. They're not the ones. He's the one. He's the star. 
He's he, he made the Usos. He made the whole bloodline. And he's given them chance after chance, but it sucks when family betrays you. So he's going to give them all kinds of chances like a good father or a good tribal chief. But what they need to do now is come out here, bow down, acknowledge and apologize to me. And suddenly, the Usos music plays. And they come out and get a huge pop because they're over now. And their story or their defense for this is they aren't trying to get back into the bloodline. What happens if you lose? They're going to win at Money in the Bank, and when Roman, when you lose, you're the one that's out. No more tribal chief. And then they kind of insinuate that maybe their brother Solo should be the tribal chief, and Roman starts laughing, and then did you like this, Brian, when Roman is laughing, Solo ain't laughing, he's kind of almost considering it on his face, and you see Roman turn around and see that Solo's not laughing, and then he stops laughing. I started considering it too. <laughs> no, because I was thinking about it. You know, like we saw everything with Wardlow and MJF and how after that happened, Wardlow wasn't elevated or anything. He went right to mid-card. Solo's been presented with top guys the whole time. It's not crazy. I mean, I'm not, they're not going to do this, but it's not crazy to take someone like that and make them the head of the table and just keep presenting them as a serious guy who doesn't, even when he loses, you don't remember it. But who else is sitting at the table then? That's the problem. There you go. See? It's him and two Usos. Because he's pretty much, he's, he's a fucking lonely man eating lunch by himself at the table. And you'll have to eat your lunch all by yourself because I'm already gone. So anyway, when Roman and Jimmy get in a face-off and start yelling at each other off mic and everything, Jimmy pie faces Roman and Jay super kicks him. And they get in a big four-way, and here comes security and the referees, and they're trying to pull them apart. And one of the Usos hits a big dive, because of course you have to right before they go off the air, and boom, scene. So we're all set for Money in the Bank. And that's, again, this was better than any match they had on this program, and it's what people are watching for. Closing SmackDown comments, no, young Brian. There's two things to watch for right now. LA Knight and whatever's going to happen with the bloodline. And when you get Roman on there for a week, it's always bigger than when you don't have him. And, you know, I mean, it, we're now going into a good little run here where it's just been this core five people with Heyman. Four, four people in Heyman <laughs> uh, doing this thing. <laughs> At some point, you either have to add to this change it up, someone new in it, or something has to happen. I know that the ending may not be anywhere near, or maybe it is, who knows, but... Somebody's got to end up in the hospital on life support, or some tragic incident has to happen in somebody's life to further this thing along in, a, in, a, in a, one of the peaks instead of one of the valleys, is what you're saying. Feels like something has to happen soon. Or the, the bank has to be robbed if it's a heist movie or whatever. Or, or maybe the bank has already been robbed, but now the loot has to go missing. Some shocking, sharp turn. Heyman has the loot. You know what? What about <laughs> this? What about if they put... They have Solo and Roman team up with Heyman in a six-man tag, and the Usos can bring me in to be oh. <laughs> their partner. And I can see after, after 30 fucking let's see what was it uh, 30 or uh, four years if he could remember which one of my knees he's supposed to work on it was tough enough getting him in the ring in 1989 you think you're going to convince him to work a match now oh, damn i'll tell you what i may never have been the goddamn athlete that jim thorpe was but i at least can say that i've had one opponent that i could blow up paul Heyman. what do you think paul's finishing maneuver will be the manchurian landslide <laughs> Thank you. I'll be here all week. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, what are you doing all week over there at the Arcadian Vanguard and with the wrestling news? Always so much happening. Get news about all of it on Twitter at Super Podcast or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. Of course, 
every single day, you can get the wrestling news direct to you for free. Your daily free wrestling newscast available directly from the wrestlingnews.com. And is it free? And it's free. Wherever you find your favorite podcast, look for Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News. Much more to come from The Wrestling News. Stay tuned for that. Want to make mention this week on Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon, he's going to have the entire interview we played a snippet of a few weeks ago that he had with Dusty Rhodes about 15 years ago. Hear this with his notes about what was really going on at suawpod.com. I look for Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon wherever you find your favorite podcast. That episode comes out this Wednesday. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Membership! Go through the archive today at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And there'll be a new episode once we have to stop watching some of this crap every day of the week. <laughs> the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership. You know, if there's a giant communications blackout for a couple of weeks where there was no television and no Twitter and no email and no podcasts. Sounds like heaven. Heaven is a place without podcasts. That would be like Shangri-La, a copless town. Heaven is a Wednesday night, I believe, is one of our songs. Yeah, one of our one of our songs. One of our songs. It, yes. <laughs> we have so many. You and I are like Lennon and McCartney. It's amazing. If we put out an album of our stupidity of singing, I bet you... Now, wait a minute. We could chart. We could chart. Who You don't do a lot of... I do a lot of singing on here. You don't do a lot of singing on here. Excuse it would be me. a solo album with you backing me up every once in a while with a little yeah, yeah, and a couple of finger snaps. What about this? <laughs> oh, for God. Oh, shit, I broke it. Oh. <laughs> I'll fix that later. And what about this? Yeah, I don't know if I would uh, consider you competition for Harpo Marks. Maybe Harpo Finger Bang. All right. Well, we'll discuss this in the studio. All right. Yeah, well, you can discuss it in your own studio. I'm not going to be in your studio anytime in the near future. Brian, you know what the best feeling in the world is, though, don't you? I do. I don't know if we should talk about this kind of stuff on the air, though. No, the best feeling in the world is having money in the bank. Ah. Money in the bank, baby. Yeah. That's what it's all about, and that's what we watched. Uh, I can't, let's see, there was Monday, there was Tuesday, there was Wednesday. Thank God for Thursday. Then there was Friday and a doubleheader on Saturday. But this was Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock Eastern time, emanating from the aforementioned Londinium, England. And the, uh, remember it had caused me consternation that there was going to be two Money in the Bank ladder matches amongst a total of 13 people on the same show. And at least they, they decided, okay, we'll put the men's Money in the Bank ladder match on very first thing, because at least then the girls won't take the edge off of it, the bloom off the rose, so to speak, by having one first. But then the feature attraction, not the main event, which was... Uso's bloodline business, but the feature attraction, what it's named after, is the first match on the show. Is there any balance anymore? But in the Attitude Era or in previous times, everybody in this match would have been the level of a Undertaker or a Foley or an Austin or a Rock or a et cetera, et cetera. But here we got Butch. Shaky Nakamura, Pablo Escobar, Damian Priest, Ricochet, Logan Paul, and the beleaguered L.A. Knight. So, by process of elimination, it, it, the, the match is to determine somebody that can cash in for a title match. You're going to take Butch out of that. You're going to take Shaky out of that. You're going to take Ricochet out of that, and right now, maybe in the future, but right now, you're going to take Escobar out of that. So the whole thing comes down to, I buy Damian Priest, Logan Paul, or L.A. Knight to get this opportunity, right off the bat. So now it becomes, you know, a match to do a lot of stunts with ladders, is what it, and that's... <laughs> 
obviously what they intended anyway, but if you look at it, I mean, Priest comes out and he's wearing an outfit that puts old Will Ostriches to shame, except he doesn't look like he's a teenage kid cosplaying a video game villain or a science fiction movie bad guy. He looks like one. He looks cool as shit because the suit fits him. You see what I'm saying? It's not like, oh, look, these kids are dressing up as their favorite, you know, alien and video game from Mars or whatever. Uh, Logan Paul is a natural heel, and he's a real athlete with an over-the-top personality that works in wrestling. And I don't mean he's a real athlete in terms of he's a goddamn NCAA champion. I'm saying he's obviously an athlete, and he's done shit to get attention enough for himself. And with that personality, that's kind of guy's natural for wrestling. I, how old is he? Did we ever determine that? Uh, I think he was in his late twenties. Let me double check. Well, since you've got everything right there at your fingertips, but he's not even really too late to start training. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. There you go. Guys have debuted later than that. So for his level of experience, though, in the ring, he's remarkable. Beyond the in-ring work, he has everything else. His in-ring work has been really good from what we've seen so far. Again, it's a modern style, but really good. But in terms of facial expressions, he has the promo. He has the natural charisma. He has the look. He has size. If he was ever desperate enough for money that he would work a full-time wrestling schedule, he may be the best heel in the business. Well, yeah, because, and I say his work now, obviously he couldn't lead a match. And he's not going to be in there calling intricate you know, one tackle, drop down, hip toss, kick me off, arm drag, arm drag, drop kick, whatever the fuck, on the fly. But for not only performing the moves that he's, you know, that he needs to perform, but also not hurting people and not getting in somebody else's way. For this level of experience, that's where you, you compliment his work at this point. It's not like he's, you know, goddamn Dick Byer is going to come and you know, teach a class yet, but nevertheless. But then at 12 minutes into the show, the bell rings. And it's a seven-way, 100 miles an hour. And there, there were highlights. Every time that somebody stopped Logan Paul from climbing the ladder, the, you know, they, they pop. And I'm not, what was Escobar wearing that he looked either like a 1890s train robber or a raccoon? What <laughs> did you know. see that? What was that? I did see. I didn't think those were the two options, but uh, I can't uh, explain it otherwise. Well, anyway, um, and then, you know, when you think about what I just said uh, with the process of elimination in the fans minds, Logan Paul has already had Roman Reigns and you, since he's kind of a big match guy, you don't necessarily see him cashing in versus anybody else. And then it has to be L.A. Knight or Priest. Would Who else would you buy against Reigns or Seth Rollins if it was that title? But anyway, if the multiple ladders weren't enough, Butch pulled out two tables and then got one of those cricket sticks and hit everybody with that. Anyway, at, at that point, Priest and Logan Paul uh, get a tenuous alliance where Damien started to go for him, but he he begged off and said, hey, we ought to work together. And they set up the two tables out on the floor and get them in the right place. And then, of course, Priest nails Logan Paul. And then he tried to put Butch through the table, but Butch stopped that. And then I just tried to, or stopped trying to keep track of what was going on here. Because it's just, you know, again, they had a ladder bridged from the apron to the stairs and Logan Paul splashed Priest on it and bounced off of it because the ladder's not going to break. I don't know. And they had a spot with a ladder between the ropes and the other ladder. And uh, again, it, if it was just the three guys, maybe it would be better and easier to keep track of. And then if for some reason, Butch put a ladder up on the floor and climbed it and flipped off the top of the ladder onto a group of other guys on the floor. For what reason? 
How is that going to help him get the fuck? I don't. It's a ladder match. So finally, moving to the finish, they had two ladders set up in the middle. And Logan Paul and Escobar were on one, and Ricochet and Nakamura were on the other. And then Ricochet and Logan Paul kicked Escobar and Nakamura's ladder over. <laughs> but then L.A. Knight pushed Logan Paul and Ricochet's over, and they were going to try to land on the top rope, but they didn't. So they they kind of stayed there for a minute while they got back on course, and then Ricochet gave Logan Paul, apparently, what was that supposed to be the Spanish fly? I think so. I mean, again, it was at a different angle, and it was very rushed, So, but I think that was the intention. I well, think. they had to rush it because they were trying to fucking do a goddamn uh, tightrope act with the ladder still leaning on the top rope and two 212, Logan Paul's 200-something pounds, Ricochet 160, on it, and they... <laughs> backflipped off the top rope and went head first through the tables. Actually, through the second table, the first one just turned over because they mostly missed that. And what the fuck? Why would you even think you should do something like that if you could nail it a hundred times out of a hundred? What I meant to say earlier, too, was if he worked a full-time schedule, Logan Paul could be the best heel in the business if he didn't kill himself. Because the other thing is... He seems to be willing to do anything in these matches. Yeah, But why would either guy, the, the experienced professional, Ricochet, oh my God. But but yeah, they very nearly completely head first. So anyway, then LA Knight cleared the ring of everybody else besides Logan Paul and Ricochet and had the... Uh, the, the, who had already taken themselves out and had the case in his hand and priest grabbed him by the throat and give him the goddamn deal and then climbed the ladder and got the case 20 minutes of just chaos with ladders you can't it 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 it's umpteen hospitalization angles and too many people in there that you know are just in there to do flips off the top rope. I don't know. What'd you think? I thought it was all right. Again, I've been overexposed to these kind of matches, but to me, a lot of the story was what they were going to do. I'm happy Damian Priest won this because that's a sign that they're going to maybe try to elevate him. And he has certainly shown that he warrants being elevated. Well, I think they're already in the process of it. Yeah. With the, the matches he's had recently. I think so. LA Knight, the story of the match... To me, the biggest story of the match was the fans there overwhelmingly wanting him to win, being disappointed when he didn't win, being, you know, bothered when he would get pulled down thinking he may win, and then when he didn't win, they got disappointed. Yeah. L.A. Knight is a story. Hopefully they recognize it and do something. I will say if they do do something, I'd rather it be without him having to hold the briefcase for like eight months or whatever it is, because <laughs> that's a tiresome thing. But Logan Paul... Again, he does crazy stuff, and a couple of times now it's been with Ricochet, now that I think about it, that one spot at the Royal Rumble where they crashed midair above the ring, that was him and Ricochet. Yeah. They bring out the worst in each other. He does, you know, these crazy things, and I hate that I always think about like, knee injuries and stuff, but because of his frame, just as uh, how long his legs are, some of his landings, I'm like, oh, he's going to kill his knees. If he could stay healthy, he could be great, but he does a lot of crazy shit, so let's see if he could stay healthy. <sighs> that was nasty oh. I, when they showed the replay i was like let me see where his head how did he go through that table how did he hit the ground well and the other knucklehead was right there next to him well the referees all ran to logan paul if you notice there was like two or three referees <laughs> on logan paul to see if he was alive after that they know which side of the biscuit the butter is contained on anyway the next match maybe you can explain this to me for the women's tag team title the Feared team of Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler against Happy Raquel and Gleeful Liv. And, you know, this got started and Harley needed some belly rubs, but they went about eight minutes. And Shayna gets... Raquel has been sidelined somehow. And Shayna gets Liv Morgan in the choke and then tags Ronda and Ronda comes in. 
And then Shayna clobbers Rhonda from behind and beats the shit out of her and puts the choke on her and leaves her laying and walks off. So then Raquel picks up Rhonda like a baby in her arms and power bombs her. And Liv hits that weird finish that she does off the ropes. Uh, Rhonda took a great bump on it. And one, two, three. And they won the belts. Have we missed, during our fast-forward sessions, some tease or mention or reason or conflict that Shayna should have just suddenly bombarded and beat the shit out of her best friend? I'm not sure. Because obviously I must have missed it too. The people in the building appeared shocked as well. Everyone did. Rhonda, of course. I'm intrigued by the idea of Rhonda versus Shayna if they did something that was a little different because of their backgrounds. But we'll see. It's WWE. Yeah, I can't explain uh, why this happened or what happened here. Maybe that's why they're doing it. Because they're like, nobody buys Rhonda and Shayna against these other little girly girls. So perhaps, you know, the two shooters can face off if someone like a let's say paul Heyman got his hands on something like that it could be something worth watching if it's just wwe silliness not necessarily i did have one thought so you're saying if paul Heyman was to get his hands on ronda rousey and Shayna baszler both at the same time it'd be worth watching in the booking metaphorical sense yes uh in terms of like three friends going to the nail salon i don't know but what i wanted to say it hit me during watching this match. A great move for a heel. Throw a fireball at Raquel's back. <laughs> so she can't show her back because it's filled with third degree burns. That's right up there with stomping Robert Gibson's hands and breaking his fingers so he couldn't talk to his deaf mother. <laughs> That's excellent. All right. Anyway, the next match was for the Intercontinental Heavyweight Championship. Gunther against Matthew Riddle. Good old Matthew. Matt Riddle, nothing to do with the story you talked about earlier in the show, for the record. Well, he was a guy from southern Indiana. We're not talking about him now. That's right. For the legal record, we're not talking about him. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering, before we went into this thing, can Gunther make this douchebag tolerable, right? Because Riddle, and he had came in with the hairdo that looked like Pippi Longstocking, with the braids and everything. But I got to admit, Gunther made me like Matt Riddle. Because obviously it's Gunther. Gunther was leading this thing or the agents, whoever they were, were instructing Matt Riddle in what style Gunther is supposed to be presented and to stick to that. Or somehow they got on the same page because it was serious, and Riddle was trying to do an MMA style and being straight with it, trying to take down a bigger guy, kicks and triangles and strikes and, you know, trying to go for submissions or get an arm. But the big guy would fucking chop him down with a bear paw or hit one of those big boots or, you know, again... It, then it, it, Gunther works best when he's in control and the baby face is fighting aggressively from underneath. And that's what this was with the added, you know, a uh, bonus of Riddle being a legitimate fighter and having a background for that. And this is somebody he could do it with because it made sense. So the strikes were good, hard slaps. Gunther at one point unwrapped the tape from Riddle's bad ankle so he could work on it and riddle was selling seriously selling and not you know just being a bro and a goof um the factoid that i should have been aware of but wasn't gunther has not lost a singles match on the main roster even before he won the belt so that's um i didn't even realize that that <clears throat> well there you go that's something they ought to be beaten up a little more, to be honest with you. Um, and I got so wrapped up in this, I forgot to take notes. But all of it made sense. Since Gunther sells stuff that he should logically sell at his size and with his style, but he does it in the way that he should. And the, at, at one point, Riddle caught that triangle and gotch, dare gotch. Gunther did the gotch lift powerbomb. 
And, uh, <laughs> but I mean, they really had a, an athletic struggle here. And then finally, you know, Gunther had been working on the, the bad ankle and he grabbed Riddle's foot and ch chopped the bare foot over and over and put on an ankle lock and Riddle tapped. And while the finish was somewhat abrupt and I hate seeing a baby face tap, uh, it was a great match, I thought. And Riddle was, uh, uh, Gunther found the fucking way to solve the Riddle is what happened. It was a good match. I think it's not even about solving the Riddle. I think Riddle's a talented worker. To me, as far as as a fan, what makes me, you know, want to be a fan of a wrestler or not, change his gear, have him come out where he's not completely drenched, <laughs> get rid of some of the silliness. I get naturally he may be kind of a, you know, he may not be uh, Albert beat. Einstein. Yeah. However, don't dumb it up more. Then it may be more appealing, but he comes out there and it's just, it's, for me, it's too stupid. And again, I hate his gear. And I know that's a weird thing because there aren't too many wrestlers I could say throughout history. I hated his gear, so I don't, I'm not a big no, fan of No, but he looks his. like a fucking surfer instead of a wrestler. Yeah, but it, I'm okay with a surfer. Hey, board shorts or something, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm not digging the look, but, uh, but he's talented in the ring. And a lot of it's about the way he's been used and he's been treated like a goof. Give, and, you know, give him credit in a sense because he went up there under Vince and he leaned into this shit. He leaned into the stuff that would... Work to get him on TV, this NXT guy with a MMA background. So it's not for me. I hope they change it up. You can only go so far with the Spicoli bit. Uh, Jeff Spicoli, not Louis Spicoli. Change it up. Turn him. He just lost the Gunther. Turn him. Do something different with him. That's my thought. Well, but now there comes time. That somebody needs to come out and confront old Gunther, and that would be Drew McIntyre. They got him back for the big homecoming there. He's another one from across the pond, and he got a huge pop. And what was the crowd singing? It The, the crowd was singing something, the, the same tune as, oh, scissor me, daddy. What was it? I don't, everyone just sings. They need to do like a bouncing ball thing at the bottom of the screen so you can follow along with some of these crowds. But th that's, it has to be something they do over there. They weren't saying, oh, scissor me, daddy, but it's it was the same tune as, oh, scissor me, daddy. He doesn't have scissors, he has a sword. Well, they, so they could, oh, cut me with your sword, <laughs> Drew. I don't know. <laughs> that's why I'm asking. Slice me in half. <laughs> Slice me from asshole <laughs> to appetite. <laughs> so anyway, the, there was a pie face by Gunther and a headbutt by Drew and a big kick, and Gunther went down and Drew grabbed the belt and raised it up, and he's going to be a force to be reckoned with. I guess that's a SummerSlam match, right? Uh, well, we're pretty much there now, aren't we? Have we seen them? I know we saw a bunch of stuff. Yeah, we saw a three-way, didn't we? Where it was Sheamus... McIntyre and Gunther? It like, sounds like a fucking law firm. I feel like uh, we saw these guys wrestle before. I'm not terribly excited about it. I'm sure it'll be good, but... Certainly to God, they ain't going to let Drew beat Gunther and, no. and break this streak. One would hopefully not think. But Drew played hardball. He wasn't going to come back till he liked the creative. Hey, the Gunther streak. God. Does that... Uh, you know, we just saw what happened with the Undertaker streak. Very different thing. This is uh, a different animal altogether. But does an established wrestler win the Intercontinental belt? Or do you use this? Should it be used to elevate someone so it means something? Well, it, it should still be being used to elevate Gunther. Because he ain't, he ain't iconic yet. So if you run it for another year and it becomes really dominant and really a thing, then... You could decide either way. It's probably always better to make somebody new, but how how good have you made Gunther? It it if it if he's not the the bell of the ball, then maybe it's a, a star that beats him because you don't want to beat a guy that's not all the way there with a guy that's still going up. But if he's suddenly caught on like, you know, gangbusters, then yeah, use him to elevate somebody else but it's still elevating him at this point. 
because they're just now starting to talk about it and still not beating it over the head. But you know what? They are beating over the head, don't you, Brian? The idea that Dominic Mysterio is a prick. I like the way they they they, they had one. I guess this was the only just single match with no championship, just a nice grudge wrestling match on the whole fucking deal, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, when, well, you, really, you, when you really think about it, when you look at all the wrestling we reviewed the last week, in the last few months, but specifically the last week, just having a nice, as you put it, a nice singles match. <laughs> it's a rarity nowadays. Everything's a stipulation or part of a tournament or a eliminator match. Everything is something as opposed to just a match. Well, they got to start somewhere. So Cody Rhodes and Dominic Mysterio with Rhea Ripley in the corner. If this, like you said, in AEW, this would be a Texas tornado barbed wire falls count anywhere in Cleveland match. But an eliminator and an eliminator match. Yes. If the guy wins, he comes back and gets another match with the same guy the next week. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> apparently London did not mind the American part of the American nightmare because Cody got, again, huge ovation. He's the biggest baby face in the wrestling business now. and. That just also shows you how quick things can turn around. He was a babyface in AEW, and the fans were booing him. And now he's the biggest babyface, the biggest company in the world. Although, to be fair, I think Vince McMahon, WWE, Triple H, whatever you want to say, have booked Cody Rhodes better than Cody and Tony booked Cody Rhodes. Well, yes, that's what I mean. It's present. In terms of fan rejection, it's also the booking. Yes. It, well, it, it's the same guy, but it's the presentation. You know, it, it's the same product, but you're getting a negative reaction because of the way that you're marketing it in one place and it's selling like gangbusters in the other place. And Rhea Ripley, again, is incredible. It looks like a movie star. But this, uh, we talked about how this was a perfect booking um, decision because Cody is a top guy. Dominic is not a main event level singles guy, but he's got such heat for being an annoying Dominic. So to put them together, this is perfect. And Cody didn't need to have the main event at Starcade 86 with Dominic. He didn't need to. He made it plausible. Dominic would stick and run. They'd do chase scenes. Dominic could hide behind Rhea Ripley. Uh, uh, Cody was always easily in charge in a fair fight, but if somebody did something from behind or cheated or, you know, whatever, then he, Cody could be taken over on. And if Dominic would run, Cody'd go out and get him and bring him back. And then Rhea would, uh, Rhea interfered at one point to trip him so Dominic could post him and get some chicken shit heat. But Cody would stay alive but still sell for Dominic. So that was the match. And, and finally, as they're going, Dominic goes for the three amigos, but Cody turns number three into a gourd buster and makes his comeback and hits a kick, gets a two count, goes for another one. Rhea's on the apron again to distract him. And Dominic tries a quick schoolboy. And then... Dominic's going to do the 619 like his dad, but Cody catches him in his arms, <laughs> gives him a big spin around up at an Alabama slam, a Cody cutter and a crossroads one, two, three. And when Cody covered, the fans counted the three count with the referee. That's when you can tell it's a good finish. And boom, it wasn't too long. It was what it was supposed to be. It was the right finish. It was done well. And Dominic looks better because he's been in a feature fucking match with the biggest guy on, on the roster. It stood out like a sore thumb in the middle of all this chaos. Really good match. You can get away with a lot of things, and it could be some sloppiness in a match if the fans are completely into it. And Dominic is not completely polished, and Cody sometimes relies on things that he feels... It seems like maybe he thinks he should do it as opposed to it's the right time in the match to do it. Sometimes there's some sloppiness, but it worked here. Uh, good match. Dominic doesn't lose anything by losing this match. Cody continues on his trajectory. I'll say this. 
not enough is said about how good Rhea Ripley is at working ringside. Yes. She's not just standing there. She, But at the same time, she's not distracting. She's adding to. But, you know, personality, facial expressions, body language, not only in the ring, but outside the ring, she's, she's a natural. Yeah, you could tell she gets, mentally, she gets the business. She's so good. And she's great at ringside. And uh, she looked great, too. Let's just throw that in there while we're at it. Good match. I, b- I believe I already pitched that one in there in the pot for discussion. But well, I want to make sure she knows that I said it, too. Well, but I said it twice. I want her to know that. Anyway, you know, Brian, the biggest thing when you can give people a surprise. I wonder if Heyman, if Heyman learns something from this. There's not a surprise of this magnitude on every single one of these WWE premium live events. So when they get one, The people came unglued. All of a sudden, they in the middle of the show, they play a video game spot for their new video game. John Cena on the cover. And then suddenly, Cena's music plays, and out comes fucking Cena. And the babies went in the air. Did you see that fucking pop? Yeah, and you say, you know, you talk about surprises. This was a major surprise. No one knew Cena was going to be in England. I guess, was he shooting a movie? And that's how that worked out, that he was there and shooting a movie or something? Yeah, I don't know, but that's the thing. This isn't him showing up at a show in L.A. or a show in New York. This is London. No one expected him to be there. Those people yeah. went nuts. Oh, my God. And it lasted a while, too. And, you know, when he slides in the ring, the place goes even bat shittier. And he pro- did the promo and... Again, he's so natural. I'm not going to recount everything that he said, but he put the people over and he wondered why that the WWE took this long to do a pay-per-view because it's been over 20 years. And then he started talking about, (laughs) I don't know if they made this reason up, but I don't think that Anybody has, uh, in modern times, have people in the office said, we don't want to do a pay-per-view in England because the fans will be too loud and it'll distract from the show? I don't know if that is the reason, but (laughs) word has gotten out over the years that if the fans react in a way that Vince may not want them to, that they may get the bizarro world or something. So that part of the story is out there. Well, I think it was just basically when they were trying to sell pay-per-view still... They couldn't fucking sell a goddamn pay-per-view at three o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday or whatever. So, but nevertheless, John put him over. You are the show and you've earned his respect or my respect, blah, blah, blah. And they chanted for him. And he put, you know, the UK audience, I, I, it sounded like Jackie Gleason and a Miami beach audience is the greatest audience in the world. And then he announces he's there to bring WrestleMania to London. And that's when I realized, okay, where was WrestleMania supposed to be next year? Oh, geez, I forget. I mean, the bidding's over. I think it's done. It is going to be somewhere next year. Well, how long do you think it's going to take them to get to Wembley Stadium? However long it takes to get some government subsidies. (laughs) No, no. I I got the idea from this. Just mark it down now. I don't know if it's going to happen, but mark it down, I said it. I got the idea from this promo that they've decided they're going to draw a bigger crowd at Wembley Stadium than fucking Tony does, and they're going to do it as soon as possible, and they're going to announce it a year or two years or whatever out and, uh, and break that record. Now, I will say this. I had the same reaction. This is a response, the timing of it to AEW running this major success at Wembley Stadium. They haven't even run it yet, and it's already a major success. WWE saying, watch this. You think your fans are excited? We're going to get these people pumped up. And watch them book Wembley and try to get an exclusive deal. And do you, well, I don't think AEW ever better try to run Wembley Stadium again. Would that not be completely pushing one's luck? When you look at the status or the state of the company right now, you would think, but you never know what could happen. I mean, Arthur Ashe wasn't as big the second year as it was the first year. Wembley's a whole different animal, but who knows where the company is in five years? 
Well, maybe ever in wrestling is three to five years, but it ain't going to be quick. They're not, they're not doing a quick return. Anyway, so Cena does this promo, and then suddenly music, Grayson Waller. God damn it. And the fans were chanting, shut the fuck up. And he shits on the idea of WrestleMania in England. It needs to be in Australia. Here's what I was going to say earlier in the program. We were talking about SmackDown. This guy is not going to... He's playing a heel. Either they're telling him to do this, or this is the kind of stuff he wants to do. But it's totally fake, because it's obvious that he's trying to be a heel on purpose because Grayson Waller would not talk to John Cena like he was a jobber. It's see-through that he's getting heat, in quotation marks, on purpose. When he offers to help Cena by making him go viral and save his career, it works if two guys are on the same level. Or if if John was the, the main event guy from... 15 years ago and this is the main event guy now or if it's the manager being a smart ass or whatever but then it's a nobody here telling a movie star off and it doesn't it's it's it was even worse than the thing that they did with theory because theory at least had been on television and, and gotten a number of wins and was being pushed and vince's handpicked whatever and Theory ended up beating Cena in a fucking match. But do, do you see what I mean? With Grayson Waller, yes, you can be a smart-ass heel, but it needs to be from the fucking smart-assness of you're the greatest of all time, but I think I can fucking take you, and I'm going to do that, and then do something low-down or despicable to make sure people know you're the fucking heel instead of going, yeah, you're a nobody. I'm a... You can't be that delusional, right? You know, I thought when Cena came out there, okay, he's going to do something, and then one of the lower card guys will come out there so Cena could hit his finish and get a big pop. And when he made the big announcement, not even an announcement, just the proclamation of why he was there, the ridiculous reason that he gave for why he traveled across the world to go to this show, but he delivered the ridiculous lines pretty well. When he was doing that, I'm thinking, oh, they're not going to do an angle here. This is perfect. He's going to come out here. These people are going nuts. He said what they want to hear. Leave on a high note. Mean Gene announces, yeah. we have a record audience. No one attacked Mean Gene. He left right after he said that. <laughs> so when Waller started coming in, I groaned. I'm like, oh, of course they have to do this. Of course, Carlito has to confront Steve Austin at WrestleMania. It's always the same thing. And then... It went on too long. Yeah. That was the other thing. If it was a yeah. quicker thing, it'd be something to talk now John, about. John wasn't long, but once that Grayson Waller came out. He kept going on the mic. Time slowed to a crawl. And then, you know, basically Cena listens to the whole spiel and then passes on the offer <laughs> and turns to fire up the crowd and Waller nails him from behind and gets some heat on him for a second, take his, takes his shirt off and Cena stands up and just picks him up and gives him the F you and then walks off. It, it, I don't know. You know, again, I've, I've said what I think about Waller and the, the confrontation here. It, it just didn't, it didn't do anything for anybody. But speaking of not doing anything for anybody, you know what it was time for at this point? The women's Money in the Bank ladder match. And we had Bailey and Eo and Zelina and Zoe and Trish and Becky. And as I mentioned at the top of this thing, yes, at least they put the guys match on first so that the girls didn't take the goddamn edge off of that. But again, they start the thing with a six-way fight on the floor. They had a ladder in the ring in 30 seconds. They're, they're balancing ladders. They're fighting on the desk. There's handcuffs involved. There's ridiculous teeter-totter bumps or whatever the fuck they're doing. I can't watch 620-pound girls do stunts with ladders for 20 minutes, especially when I've just seen guys do the same thing. But also, does anybody... No wonder... 
that nobody believes injury angles anymore. A, a, one spot was a power bomb off a ladder onto another ladder. If a 120-pound girl takes that and bounces up and lives to fight another day, then how can it hurt powerhouse hops? So then what do you got to do to powerhouse hops? Let's get a Volkswagen, but not just a bug. We need a bus and run him down. But shit, on the other channel, that 180-pound guy that pumps out septic tanks for full-time work just did that and jumped up, so we're going to have to fucking put barbells in the back of the car. So what I'm saying is, is the girls, is somebody's going to get hurt, and besides that, for business reasons, girls have no business doing these fucking matches. Because it's ridiculous, and then, again, it doesn't matter what kind of bump a miscellaneous girl or guy takes if they don't give a shit about you specifically. But then it's equally as detrimental to business when, as I said, if these girls can do all this shit with these ladders, the same ladders that the guys goddamn get hit with or land on or whatever the fuck, the same furniture and all that shit, and they get up and finish the fucking match, then what do you have to do to hurt the fucking guys that are twice their size? And, and you're into the territory already where everything is something that really does fucking hurt. 20 minutes of this, and then EO handcuffed Bailey and Becky to each other through the middle of the ladder, climbed up over the top of them, and got the briefcase. Your thoughts, Brian? It was fine for what it was. I'm just happy they're doing something to elevate EO Sky. I think she deserves it. I think her work has been good. I think the fans have reacted to her. She's someone that seemingly out of nowhere, the fans in Puerto Rico started cheering for, and that hasn't gone away since. Not as big as LA Knight, not saying it is, but they should ride that wave, and she's been good. I enjoy EO Sky. <sighs> and I'm not going to say too much else about the match itself. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's move on to the world title number three match where Seth Franklin Rollins defended against Finn Balor. And this was a pretty much professionally exhibited example of modern wrestling. I don't think anybody does high spots anymore where the baby face actually out wrestles or outsmarts the heel and the heel gets pissed off about it and the fans laugh at him for it. I don't know that either of these guys did any kind of wrestling move or hold whatsoever that wasn't invented after 2002. Um, but it was, it was a raw match with no commercials and longer. They're both professionals. You know, that that's, I guess the thing is that it's just a modern raw match. They're all professionals. It's the same kind of thing that we see on TV, but longer. And did anybody, you know, buy Finn is going to win this thing. And then he didn't. So Finn hit two of the stomps on Seth on the floor and then the drop kick and went for the stomp off the top but he got distracted by Damian Priest who had come down, and there's the story there. Priest came down with his briefcase, like, is he going to cash in? But who will he cash in against? And then the distraction momentarily made him miss the stomp, and Seth hit a curb stomp, one, two, three. There's not much more to say. No, it was just an <laughs> all right match. I mean, we've seen Rollins have this match these kind of matches. I mean, he's a good worker, but there was nothing special about the match. He knew Finn Balor wasn't going to win, and it's been obvious they've been teasing Balor versus Priest for a while. I'm assuming we're going to get there sooner rather than later. Uh, Remember, Balor had that, what was his name? Jordan Devlin. They were buddying up backstage, and he's pulling away from uh, the Judgment Day, so maybe you have their split. Oh, yes. I forgot about uh, the devil, Mr. Jordan. Whatever his name was. I hate it when these factions break up. It's always sad for the children. 
But anyway, it was time for our main event. And this is what everybody came to see and what everybody bought the ticket to see, blah, 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 for the tag team title, Jimmy and Jay, the Usos, against Roman Reigns and the Usos' brother Solo in the Bloodline Civil War. And I understand at the start they were in no hurry. They were milking it because the issue is over and Roman's over, and they had to approach the family feud and build it and etc. But without trying to give anything away for later on, did this match need to be 33 minutes bell to bell? I hate to say this, but I did not give a shit about this match except for maybe like the last few minutes, and then it was all about you're waiting for the story more than any of the actual matches with the bloodline. And well, and, and also in the result, the finish, who's going to win? We were waiting for that. I can see having them again on this show already, 33 fucking minutes. And, and they built it where Roman and Solo were in control most of the time. Roman didn't show weakness early on. They got a long, deliberate heat. And I say long and deliberate heat. There was nothing wrong with it. If you were on a house show and you needed time and they built it, you know, but again, 20 minutes in, uh, they did a nice spot where Roman went for the Superman punch and Jimmy ducked and cross-bodied both of them over the top rope, took a great bump. And they gave the, the Usos some comebacks and some flurries there. That's where Roman at one point hit two Superman punches and went for a spear, but both the Usos were there and speared him and got a two count and Solo saved and they were really cooking at that point. And maybe they could have sped up the first 15 minutes, you know, just to get there a little quicker. But they, they did a lot of good shit back and forth. And as you mentioned, you know, the, by the last what, 10, 8 to 10 minutes, they were cooking. And they even did a referee bump, which you thought, okay, this is going to be it. And they're they're taking people on the ride at this point. And that's when Jay hit Roman with a super kick, and then they both gave him the 1D and covered him, and no referee is there. And then, so they continued the match, and that's where you probably thought, ah, shit, now they're, the Usos are going to get fucked. That was their chance. Solo was dealing out spikes like crazy. Uh, Roman and Solo gave both the Usos rock bottoms. Solo spiked Jimmy and held Jay up, and Roman and Solo spiked and speared him together and then stacked Jay and Jimmy side by side, and Roman covered both of them. <laughs> the referee had crawled back in at this point, and they kicked out at two, and that got a big pop, and... <sighs> Honestly, you can't. The referee wouldn't count if he was covering both guys, but because of the fact that this whole deal is over and it got a huge pop, I'll allow it. Judgment for the fucking plaintiff or whatever. But then the heels get more heat, and finally, Solo's going to splash Jimmy through the desk off the railing, but he missed and went through the desk, and that took him out of the picture. And that's where Jay and Roman had a back and forth and Roman had him covered, but Jay nut shot at him. And then they super kicked him, both of them about a half a dozen times and a splash off the top by Jay on Roman cover one, two, three, and the place blew up. And that's the first time that Roman has been pinned since what they say, December, 2019. I think something of that nature. Something Three and like a half that. years, thereabouts. Yeah. Um, it was the right finish, and it's still it, being beaten by two guys in a tag team match is different than putting a single guy over in a single match. And historically, world champions have lost falls in tag matches to set shit up. I didn't mind that. I th If they'd have beaten solo, people would have kind of been, eh because that's what you would expect. So, and, and obviously Roman wanted to get the family over. So the only problem I had was, goddamn, the first 15 minutes was, was a schlog, wasn't it? 
like I said, I didn't really care about the match. And it was a schlog, and it took a while. But they flesh these things out, and they give these guys time. But I was waiting to see what was going to happen, and I was willing to sit through the match, even though it wasn't terribly exciting to me. Well, there you have it. Well, there you have it. <laughs> and we still have more somehow. God damn it. There's more wrestling to talk about, isn't there? God. Yes. Folks, I promise you, one of these days it won't be like this. But Mama says it bees that way sometimes. Folks, I promise you, next drive through questions. I promise, questions. Uh, I've got a question for you. Uh-oh. Why do we have to watch all this shit? We don't. Want to cut back? Couple packs a day and go down from five packs a day to two packs a day. <laughs> Boy, we need to cut back. All right. Well, we got one more collision to have. Yes, that's right. We're going to collide with collision. And Brian, have you noticed that this podcast that we're doing now, it's kind of like, kind of like AEW's normal television programming. Starts out with a lot of piss and vinegar and ends up with a lot of regret and fatigue. But uh, Collision last week did, uh, uh, as we talked about, did lower ratings than the, obviously, the debut week. We had mentioned when we talked about the debut episode, okay, it started at, I think the average was 800,000. Let's see where it's going to go. It's obviously going to go down because generally the debut is the big deal. But how far and, and what will the ratings pattern be? So this is a week old, but before we talk about Collision on July 1st, what was last week's ratings? And the thing I'm interested in is, did they keep a bigger percentage of the audience they started with than Wednesday night does? Because I think we established Wednesday night lost a little over 25% of their starting audience this past week. Well, these are the ratings for AEW Collision June 24th, 2023 on TNT, compiled by WrestleNomics. The overall number, on average, 595,000 viewers. Yeah, so uh, down a little bit over 200,000. Uh, you know, instead of going through this in granular detail, it is a week old. What was, what was where, where'd they start? What was the top of the 9 o'clock hour and where'd they finish? They started 8 o'clock, 8 to 8.15 p.m. with uh, the opening promos from everyone, and then going from that into the Chris Jericho, Minoru Suzuki, Naito segment, Ooh. and then Miro's promo. 605,000 viewers. 605. 605. Trademark. Damn right it is. So where were they at the top of 9 o'clock? Nine o'clock hour, which was a video for the Owen Hart tournament video. Well, a video for the video. A vi an Owen Hart tournament <laughs> video as and, well. And several people. As well as Nyla Rose versus Willow Nightingale with picture in picture, 592,000 viewers. So they lost 13,000 people from start through the first hour. Okay. Uh, and just for the records, we discussed it last time. So let's include it this time just for uh, comparison. Open with the key demo, 283. At the 9 o'clock hour, 274. <laughs> and then finally, for the main event, which began at 9.30, quarter 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m., which spills into the final quarter with plenty of picture-in-picture, picture, Punk, FTR, and Ricky Starks versus Bullet Club Gold and the Guns. 9.30 to 9.45, 616. 9.45 to 10 p.m., 6.34. And for the key demo, 288 and 289. So, wait a minute. I'm writing down numbers as fat. 288 and 289? For key demo for the last two quarters, correct. So, their two-hour program started with 605,000 people and ended with 634,000 and had picked up to 616 in seg or is not quarter seven. And they also picked up 6,000 people in the key demo from start to finish, so it's not the numbers that Wednesday does, but apparently for people trying to watch this program, there's nothing where they say, I've had enough, I can't take anymore, this is ridiculous, get me the fuck out of here. There was a big drop in the number right before the main event match. It went from 592 to 554, that was the biggest drop of the episode, but then for the main event match, it picked right back up, 616, 660 or 634. 
Okay, so even 554 from where they started at 605, that is not even 10% of the uh, 50,000 of 605. It's not even 10% of the audience. At their lowest point, they had lost less than 10% of the audience. I don't know if you would know this offhand, and it's not necessarily a perfect equation or perfect comparison maybe, but for TBS Wrestling on Saturday nights, and we looked at ratings differently then than we do now, but you were someone paying attention to different things. Yeah. Did the audience typically stay to the end of the episode on Saturdays? You know, we did not in those days. I mean, it was done, but we didn't care about the quarter hours. The first time that, especially on Saturday night, to be honest, at 6.05, they were doing numbers. Uh, I remember that, time in uh, April of 1990, the Saturday night show did a 4.0 rating of the rating measurement of the time. And Sunday night, the main event show at six o'clock on Sunday did a 4.4 that translated to around 3 million homes, but homes then were given a, a particular number of people. They weren't measuring individual viewers. And, and a home at that point was 1.6 viewers. Back in the fucking 60s, a home was like three viewers because people only had one television. So the point is they measured the overall number of people for most of the shows, but then with the Clash of Champions, when they started being a thing in like 88, that's when we first started hearing about quarter hours because as you'll recall, the first Clash of Champions the highest rated Crockett television program, I think, of pretty much of all time on TBS was Flair and Sting, and they got up to, what was it, a seven-point-something rating for the main event? It increased over the Clash of Champions, and that was common. The main event would be the highest-watched segment of the program by far. And that was opposite WrestleMania. And that was opposite WrestleMania. But also, just any time of any of the clashes or, you know, any big shows, the main event, the last 15 minutes or 30 minutes or however long, it, that was usually the highest rated part of the program. It was like the uh, same thing as a house show. You start out with the prelims and people filtered in. As long as they saw the main event, they were happy. In a sense, I guess you could argue that Again, this is just week two. We don't know where the numbers are going to settle at. And this past week's show that we're about to talk about was taped. It's a different energy altogether. But I guess somewhat similar to SmackDown. You know, it starts at a level. It may be a little higher because we want to see who's going to be there at the start. But it peaks at the end because it's the main event, whether it's a yeah. match or a segment. Here, you began at 6.05. Again, it began with those promos, those uh, Saturday night's main event kind of promos with Punk, FTR, and Starks, and then the heels. So you knew Punk was there. People didn't dive off the show. They just kind of wavered around the show. And then for the main event, you got a little bit of a surge. Yeah. And well, also, there's nothing. There was something on this show to run you off, but there's nothing insulting in, in theory. Sometimes in execution, this may have not, this cake may have not risen all the way, but there was just no 20 minutes of chaos where you said, well, I've seen everything I can see or just completely uninteresting people doing stupid shit or whatever. It's more consistent. It's a, it's a wrestling program and you know that you're going to see some matches, but the big main events coming up. Plus the commentary is a big deal. Yes. I think you can actually listen to it. This is not, they're not trying to do the 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 silly show here. They're trying to be serious, and everything didn't land on this, but they're trying to be serious. And I fear, as we'll get into it in a second, that some of the excesses of the Wednesday night program may hamper their efforts, but we'll see. Um, and like you said, they had the opening brief comments from the participants in a couple of the matches. And the emphasis is on the matches and who's going to win them. And they were brief and serious. And then you get Elton John. And then, unfortunately, this was the Hamilton show and we scoffed about it. The holidays, they taped it on Thursday. 
When we have more time for emails, we'll read a couple, but we've had a number of emails from people that said, oh yeah, first they put Forbidden Door on sale, and then we heard about Dynamite and whatever the fuck else, they, and then they put this on sale. There were literally people still buying tickets at the last minute that were finding out about this thing. <laughs> so their fourth night out of how many, what was it, Friday's... In a week, they've been there four times in Toronto slash Hamilton. I, I forget exactly what nights. So at the United Center, it looked great because there were people there and they could pan the crowd and the building and give it the big feel. Here, the set was gigantic and the crowd shots were so tight, you could check the people for cavities because they couldn't pan. There was no, there was no crowd, Jerry. So that hurt a bit. The announcer mix was better than I've ever heard it, though. I could actually hear the, or maybe it was just because I was listening to the announcers, but it, did they seem clearer to you? I didn't even pick up on that, so I can't say one way or the other. Or maybe it's just the way that they talk. You can understand them. I don't know. I think that's a big part of it. Kevin Kelly, you know what? He's been doing this a long time. I first saw him in New York on TV from the IWF, the Eddie Mansfield company out of Florida. Yeah. That was like 92. I think now he's actually doing the best work of his career. I think the variety of experiences he's had and the different styles he's had to call yeah. and the different levels of information he's had to disseminate. I think right now he's actually at the best point he's ever been at as a commentator. Well, he had his challenges in the first match because he had to call MJF versus Kip Morst. And here's what they were setting, obviously, the deal is MJF, the AEW champion, is wrestling on the new show, Collision. And, of course, he picked his opponent. And I get the idea of the heel champion picking a tomato can, a pushover. But they went for the visual joke that the guy's anorexic. And to me, that, that takes the heat off of it and makes it look amateur and outlaw. If you've got a guy whose name is fucking old Dan Tucker and you've never seen him before and his record in AEW is zero and zero, he can still look somewhat like an athlete just so it doesn't make a joke of the thing and gets the heat that, yes, MJF picked a guy that we've never heard of before. Young wrestler trying to make a name for himself. He accepted this because what choice does he have? But not... Look at this guy. He looks like he just went to give blood and forgot to say when. That takes it into funny. I, am I, again, am I too picky? Yes and no. I mean, mostly no, I think. I mean, I get what they were trying to do, and I don't know what options they had. Because I also saw the other option that came out on the stage before Ethan Page. But he's a down. fucking billionaire. There are goddamn legitimate athletes trying to be involved in wrestling. A plane ticket from wherever somewhere in the middle of the United States to Toronto, $400 and give the guy a hundred bucks to be on TV and put him in a hotel. You don't just have to pick up whoever's in the goddamn parking lot with their hand out. Anyway, so MJF heat seeker and LaBelle lock, boom, tap out. And then he did the promo where he, rips hamilton and canada and all the fans did I, I didn't know canadians were hillbillies though do they have hills in canada yeah, i was a little surprised when he called the canadians hillbilly in ontario of all places a habit, you think i guess so if you were gonna call any canadians hillbillies it would be the people in ontario i, may, I would think more like saskatoon or maybe out in edmonton or somewhere Anyway, he ripped them, and then he challenged, I'll fight anybody from Hamilton, and out comes a fucking fat guy, the second coming of Gino Moore. Right? <laughs> Don't say and, that. That's the worst and, thing you can say about a human being. And, but then oh. as he's waddling down the entranceway, here comes Ethan Page, the other Page. We forgot about him. He's still around, and he comes out. And now we find out he's from goddamn Hamilton. So everybody gets a chance in their hometown. And he slapped the microphone out of MJF's hand, and, and he cut a halfway serious promo for once. And he gave his father's 
biography and local work status to make him sound like the common man from Hamilton and called MJF a bare minimum bitch. And I think it, then he, he went, he went a little too far with the Calgary public relations tour story where he has done so much for AEW and his girlfriend asked him, well, why won't they do something for you? And if he'd have just put a period on it, he finally, he got there at the end, but he tried too hard in the middle, did old Ethan Page. And finally MJF said, okay, I'll, I'll wrestle you. So we had their match and right at the top of it, I think Nigel's mic went out for a while because there was dead silence. Like I've, I've been in that position where like Kevin's reaching over there trying to help him plug something in or whatever the fuck, or they're talking to the truck. But anyway, um, as you mentioned, it was nice to hear the announcers not having hemorrhages on everything. So they had a serious match and that's the, the theme of this television program. They're having wrestling matches. They're being serious. They're not, doing the cute shit and the nonsensical stuff. And that's why they're, I think, one of the reasons why they're keeping an audience from start to finish, because if you're going to dedicate yourself to this show, you know what you're getting. You're getting a wrestling show. And you're interested in seeing them do it, because it's different. There was no real break spot in this match. They just kind of went, but it was the best... Ethan Page match, of course, I've paid very little attention to any of his others just because he annoys me, but he had some fire. He made a comeback, hit a power slam, got a two count, hit a twist of fate. It took about five years to get to the top rope, and MGF crotched him. And then, you know, he uh, Page foiled a superplex and hit a power slam off the top for a two count. And then, because he'd had his leg work, worked on, when Page tried the razor's edge, his knee buckled, and MJF hit the dragon screw on a, on the bad leg, and then the heat seeker, boom, one, two, three. And he's getting that finish over, so that's good, because MJF has had a shortage of matches where he can win with his finish. And that's what he needs to be doing a little bit more, just for the sake of it. But, uh, I mean, again... I'm not a big Ethan Page fan, but this served to help MJF out. I thought Ethan Page was capable of more than he's been doing for a while, and you and I have always disagreed on it. I thought the match was okay. I thought he went too long on the mic. I'm not a fan of wrestlers in general. The whole, you know, you may be all about you and taking care of you and your family. I care about the company. <laughs> Give me a, you don't even have a union. Stop it. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of that stuff, but, uh, he tried to take real world shit and incorporate it in his promo. And it was, I guess the first overtly baby face promo we've seen from him. We'll see if this was just a one-time thing or if it goes anywhere, but it was an all right match. It was nice to see MJF on the show, I guess. I guess you're not sure. It was nice to see MJF on this show. All right. Anyway, we're going back to the Owen Hart tournament. And I was interested in seeing this Dustin Rhodes and powerhouse Hobbs again, a veteran in the ring with a younger guy. And that can lead to the younger guy developing and flowering and blossoming and prospering, except he's got two anchors around his neck, no function, Marshall and miscellaneous white girl. And I thought they'd gotten away from that, but apparently maybe QT was just out of town one week. So it, they had a nice match again. Uh, Powerhouse got on Dustin early and Dustin would fight back, but then Hobbs glommed him from behind and posts him and he got some color and we go to the break. And when we came back, Dustin was a bloody mess, but he made a comeback and hit a crossroads. And then did you see, I have never seen anybody do the pile driver like Bobby Eaton used to. And Dustin Rhodes did it. And that's not a compliment. <laughs> because, <laughs> well, no, I've said for years, and Bobby said it, the one thing that Bobby Eaton could not do is give a pile driver. No matter how hard he tried, and he had a thing, it was a mental thing, whatever, when he'd have the guy up, when he started to sit down, 
instead of going flat on his ass, he would bend his right leg back underneath him, and his left leg would be straight out, and the guy'd kind of go down sideways. He'd protect him, but then and it didn't look good. And, and he didn't know why he did that, and he couldn't not do it. And that's why, except if it was specifically necessary and called for, he never did a pile driver. But Dustin did the pile driver the exactly same way. So I, I don't know, but anyway, they have finally hit another false finish, and then QT got up on the apron, and Dustin nailed him. And then Hobbs squashed Dustin in the corner, hit him with a clothesline and a spine buster, but only got a one count. And then Dustin hit the power slam two count. And then Hobbs kicked Dustin into the ropes. And that's where QT nailed him. And then Hobbs hit another spine buster, one, two, three. I thought the whole reason for Hobbs versus Dustin was that Hobbs would get a win over a, a name and a, you know, quality level opponent, but it was just with QT's help. But therefore, Hobbs still wins and advances. I mean, nice match. Nice to see Dustin out there. If he's going to really be retiring at some point soon, I wish they would do something more with him for whatever time he has left in the ring. Powerhouse Hobbs is being wasted if he's with QT Marshall and whoever this woman they're trying to shove down everyone's throat is. Miscellaneous white girl? QT doesn't work. I mean, it's not just us. It's everyone who's been saying it, and it's been years now at this point, and they still force him on that show for no reason other than the fans don't want to see him. I, I can't explain any other reason. Well, no, the reason is because he's, he's a nice guy, and he's helping Tony in the office and carrying papers around, so <laughs> look at the hometown shit we're seeing. Right. Anytime somebody is, if, if Tony likes you, if you're in your, the, your hometown or you, boy, you, you really deserve to be on this big show, uh, you know, but anyway, at, at least they're putting Hobbs over. At least they're putting him over. And, you know, you've been saying it and I hadn't even noticed the tournament brackets are set up. It's actually Joe and Punk, not in the finals. Well, and I saw that. I misread, apparently, the brackets that I saw on Twitter because it's so very small. But Joe will meet Punk next week, but that's the semifinal. And I, it, this way that gives him so many places to go because I don't, I don't know that Punk has to win. If they have the right finish, Joe could win or Punk could win. And then Joe could cost Punk the tournament against Hobbs, which would then cause Punk and Joe to go off on their own little issue mission and let Hobbs be the tournament winner and do something from that. There's a number of different things they can do. But at least we're going to get Punk and Joe, which is probably the, the best ratings draw for the kind of audience that this show is being aimed for to begin with. The people who want to see a slobber docker, as they say. Hey, they've spent two weeks building it up, but we'll get there. Um, Anthony Henry was back. I didn't know he lived in Toronto. See, they bought a plane ticket for somebody. He couldn't have driven up there from, where is he from? The Carolinas? The workhorsemen? He has to be from the Carolinas. Anyway, Miro got another one-sided squash match, as it should have been. Henry got a flurry, and he did a good job, but then he did a good job. And Miro won with the camel clutch. And then this is where, Brian, you tell me, but I think this is where, according to some emails we got and according to my personal preferences, I think this is where the show took a hit, at least quality-wise and potentially, you know, the momentum. Bullet Club interview Jen and Juice and the Gun Boys with Tony Schiavone, followed by... The Bullet Club's Jay White against Ricky Starks, 30 minutes for this next bit of business to all transpire, and the interview didn't start it off well. No, it did not. And as you said, we got a lot of feedback. Cult of Cornet Facebook group, emails, some tweets, listeners of this show, listeners who have enjoyed a lot of the people we're talking about, 
and they said that this promo went too long and it killed the room, and the match after it suffered greatly because of that, and that's what we saw play out here, and this was in an edited form. This was after having several days oh, shit. to produce it. That's right. Do you think they cut anything out of this? I'm not saying they did, but this is them after having a chance to sweeten it or do whatever they had to do to make this more palatable. Well, is it because Jay White has never done television interviews because he's never been on television? They don't have interviews in New Japan. To my awareness, they don't have television in any promotion he'd worked for in the UK or Australia or wherever the fuck he's from. In New Japan, sometimes after a big match, you may get on the mic and just start talking to the fans, but there's no rush. You can kind of take your time. And again, there's a translation thing. And then they do the scrums, the press conferences afterwards where a wrestler shows up and breathes heavy and does their promo there. He's done well with that, is what we've heard from a lot of people. and We've seen a little bit of it, but this was not the setting for his promo at all. Well, it was... It was all of them, and they had to go back. Tony was just standing there through the whole thing because Jay White took the microphone and did a promo, and it was eh. And then the guns come in, and they picked it up with some oomph because they've got personality, but after they got finished, then Tony jumps in and tells them that, well, the rest of the Bullet Club's barred from ringside for this match you've got with Starks coming up, Juice. And then Jay White took the microphone back, and cut a promo on punk and wants his belt that's in his goodie bag and it was meandering and went back and forth and poor tony shivani sounds 80 years old now something with his voice i don't know then they started talking about ftr and it just got longer and longer and juice didn't talk the guy was wanting to hear from that's right and then when they finished this long promo, then on the screen, Punk and FTR and Starks popped up and Punk responded to them. And FTR talked about the guns. And Starks promo Juice, and it was long. And by then, they're at 9 o'clock. And Starks and Juice was the 9 o'clock hour match. And they had a good wrestling match. It, it was serious. There was no flips and no floor and etc. But the problem was, is it was a small crowd who were worn out by the previous segment, and this wasn't a fantastic match. It was a good, solid match, and it was a little long, too, because it was almost 15 minutes. And then finally, Starks won it, one, two, three, But then as the heels were going to surround him, FTR and Punk ran out, no music, to even the odds, and the heels bailed out. But a lot of the fans booed the babyfaces making the save. (laughs) So it was 30 minutes from the start of the Bullet Club promo to the end of this match, and it just, it was a while. It took a while. It did, and as much as we've liked Juice Robinson and Jay White, you know, he's been all right, and the guns show a world of potential, they're still being established. They're not established with the casual fan, with the average viewer, with the person who's not sitting in Hamilton. And they didn't really seem to react well to this. When they're in there with Punk or FTR, it's one thing, but when they're working long matches and people aren't fully invested in them yet, they shouldn't be working long matches. Yes, I concur. Well, thank you. Speaking of somebody that shouldn't be working matches, is Sean Spears uh, uh, back again? They're trying this again. What is going on with him confronting Christian Cage and the dinosaur? I was conflicted on this. My first thought was, no, you can't do this. (laughs) You have to do something else right now with Christian and Luchasaurus to establish them more as the TNT champions. Sean Spears, we've seen. We've seen the way he's been used. It hasn't worked. Now, I will say, you talk to wrestlers, they put him over big time. He's one of these guys that they all say how great he could be, but he's been used horribly. And I was ready to completely dismiss this, but he got serious at the end of the promo. And it was a different tone than he usually has. And I said, okay, I'm going to see what they do with this. 
And if he's going to be on collision, there's probably a reason for that. And that reason is probably people there are probably going to bat for him and saying, let's try something different with him here. So for that reason, I'm going to give it a chance and see where they go. But beyond that, I had the same reaction you had. And and you're right. I mean, we haven't seen him stink the joint out, but it's just he's always in either something that is silly or extraneous or just didn't work or the whole chair thing or whatever the fuck. Well, all right, let's see what happens. And we're happy to know that the TBS title is still fully around the waist of Chris Statlander. She resisted the challenge of Lady Frost, the granddaughter, apparently, of Tony Marino. I was wondering if you watched the match to hear that when they said that on commentary. I didn't realize that. Amazing. Batman. Batman with two Ts. Just <laughs> in case DC Comics ever went through Pittsburgh and happened to notice anything. Because that would stop the lawsuit. Not that he's dressed would. like Batman, but he Not had an he, extra T. Yeah, nothing about the cape or the cowl <laughs> or the gray and black suit or the utility belt would have stood out, but the or the, the two T's. The or side the side kick kick. Robin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we got to put Statlander over because at first, uh, she was years ago, she was hanging out with the Puddin' Gang. She was a space alien from the Andromeda Galaxy. She fit right in with the fucking circus clown car. But she had those ACL injuries. And now that she's come back, she's in shape. You could, the determination to not just one, but two of those on both, both legs to work out, do the rehab, come back from that. She's, looks in great shape. She's not a space alien anymore. She's serious. Um, so we got, and she won with a tombstone. Again, I'm not sure the tombstone be the best thing for a young lady with two bad knees, but we will, we'll work with that. But Statlander, I'd like to see her against Rhea Ripley. Another one of those interpromotional dream matches. Give us two matches, Statlander versus Rhea and Butch versus Pockets. That's not the second match I would pick as a dream match, I don't think. I want to see Butch beat the ever-loving shit out of pockets. Anyway, um, I liked Andrade's match the other day, but they they should not let him speak on television. Because then it whatever he's saying, most wise asses, and who's watching TV and wrestling on Saturday evenings, smart asses, they're going to laugh at him trying to pronounce words because it's bad. And as he was yelling at the House of Black or the House of Black, they got came up on the monitor behind him and responded to him in this pre-tape. But, um, yeah, so we got that to look forward to. You know what? I was willing to go with Andrade's promo. He's fired up. He doesn't speak English. As you once put it a long time ago, he may not even be able to speak Spanish. I'm not I, sure. I can't tell. <laughs> I was willing to go with it. And I'm happy they're using Lexi Nair on this show because she's not used really on Dynamite and she's good at what she does and it feels different than Dynamite. Let me just say that. But when the House of Black show up on the monitor, somehow, whatever cameraman they've accosted and forced to film, he got into the control board and they took over this monitor that I don't like. Enough with the spooky House of Black shit. Just be a bunch of weirdos that like tattoos and like hanging out together. You don't have to do any of this spooky shit that no one likes. Maybe they like tattooing each other. There you go. There you go. But you know what it was time for now, don't you, old Brian? Like Mussolini on commentary. That's CM right. Punk is on color commentary for the Owen Hart tournament match between Rowdy, Roddy, Strong, and Samoa Joe. And did you notice Punk may not be that mo that popular in Toronto or a Hamilton or whatever, but the front row loved him. Everybody that could get within range of touching him or getting his autograph, they love him. It's just those cheap people up in the fucking stands that th they don't have enough money to be able to like CM Punk. Anyway, um, you know, how can I say I didn't like Roderick Strong and Samoa Joe? Because that was the reason why that I was involved with and interested in the Ring of Honor style. 
this is what, and these guys, and of course now they're the previous generation, but they were the generation of guys that showed what modern pro wrestling could be. They weren't fucking constantly breaking furniture. Nobody was doing goddamn somersaults and flips. They were in shape, believable guys, hitting each other hard in safe places, acting like it's a struggle. Roddy's cardio is incredible. He's in tremendous shape. He wasn't blessed with size, but he's strong as a bull, and he he works the way that he should for his size and gimmick. And Joe the same way. He's believable because he's a fucking beast. And he can pull out a dive every now and then, and it looks like a goddamn flying greyhound, but he will beat you and pummel you down. And he's a got a mean countenance when he does it. And and that is what I wished that instead of this silly joke crowd, the buckaroos and their ilk, that the passion of these guys could have been looked kindly on by a gullible billionaire so that you could have modern style, athletic, competitive, serious pro wrestling that people could enjoy instead of a bunch of goddamn silliness from the fucking Ringling Brothers set. Their chops and forearms landed. They weren't standing there daring the other guy to take a free shot. They were trying to avoid him, which is what you would do. Aggression. Uh, you know, Roddy sells and fights from underneath. Well, Joe is a very formidable looking guy. He moves his fucking weight around. A punk was good on color. He mentioned he has never beaten Samoa Joe, which is important to say. And he's, he's named Brian, the fans of collision. We're the colliders out there for all the colliders out in the audience. Yeah. I don't know about that one. Um, <laughs> But anyway, they went back and forth, Roddy and, and Joe, and uh, again, two really good workers doing what they do. And finally, Roddy had built, he had tried to get some kind of backbreaker for a while, and he couldn't pick Joe up. But finally, he hit a backbreaker, but he sold his own knee. And then he hit a kick and got a two count. They go back and forth again, and Roddy gets an angle slam on the big son of a bitch for a two count. But then, boom, just seconds later, Joe maneuvers behind, gets the rear choke, and takes Roddy down, and he passed out. And the referee stopped it. There was no tap. I don't mind a heel using a sleeper or a choke or a submission hold, but I hate it when the fucking baby face taps. Should always either referee stop it or pass out. And again, it was a good solid match, and... I bet you this kept the audience like the last week's. We don't have ratings yet. It's holiday. We may not have them for the drive through I don't know, but you wouldn't, if you wanted to, to watch a wrestling program, you would not have changed the channel on this match. You wanted to see what was going to happen. And then afterwards, Joe comes back in the ring and picks Roddy up and gives him a power slam on a chair in the ring. Just one, just once. And Punk rolls in, and Joe leaves, and they stayed with it. And this is the most important part, and there's a couple points to be made about this. But you saw the EMTs putting the neck brace and on Roddy and putting him on the backboard. And I wrote, amazing, it's like a wrestling show. And then the, they showed them wheeling Roddy out on the stretcher after a power slam on the chair. This show is not embarrassing to watch. This show, honestly, right now, as I'm going to mention, in a vacuum, would make you care and want to, next week, well, how is Roddy? And goddamn, who's who's going to do something about this? And is he still in the hospital or whatever the fuck? But here's the problem, not only with the, I talked about the girls' ladder matches, how can the fucking 250-pound guys get hurt? taking a bump that the 120-pound girls get up from. But this is how it's supposed to be done. A guy was power slammed by a 300-pound fucking heel on a goddamn metal folding chair. He should go to the hospital and get checked out. We should have EMTs. And there should be drama. 
But the problem is when these little hatchet headed nitwit college dropouts wearing their flowery fucking skinny jeans come off the goddamn roof through three flaming tables and pop up to take a selfie with their opponent immediately afterwards. It kind of dulls the response of the fans to when somebody tries to do it right. Which is why I've always said that all that shit, not only irresponsible for your health and the longevity of your career, but also even if it's some wrestler, I don't give a fuck whether he lives, dies, turns blue, or drops dead. It's bad for the business because you're limiting what you can do to get a rise out of people and get a sympathy on somebody that's been injured. When you've proven to them time after time that none of this shit can possibly hurt you, even when much of it does. What do you think, Brian? I thought it was a good match. I think if you want to talk about sports-based wrestling, Samoa Joe and Roddy Strong are two of the guys that exemplify that. Roddy Strong's not a big guy. And next to Samoa Joe, Joe looked massive. Yeah. Like twice the size of him. But he's an athlete and he works that style really well. Really good match. I'm not as bothered by the tap-out finish, although I think you have a great point. Uh, the post-match? Post-match was good. It was serious. It was a great way to go off the air, leaving you intrigued for next time. I thought Punk's acting was a little better than Adam Cole's. Maybe this is well, why I'm so accepting of buddy film Adam Cole right now with MJF, because I like it better than the dramatic Adam Cole. I've seen too much of that recently. You're okay, Roddy. You're okay, Roddy. You'll be all right, pal. Yeah, that was too much for me. Uh, beyond that, Punk was really good on commentary. Besides that, a, a friend like that, I just got run over by a fucking locomotive. You'll be all right, pal. You're okay. Beyond that, though, Punk great on commentary, and they've done a good job of building up the anticipation for Punk versus Joe, and you have to think it's going to be more than a one-time thing. That could be what this show needs, because right now, I think part of the problem, we don't know what the rating is, there's some real good talent on the show, there's only one star on the show. And that's not to take anything away from MJF, because I don't think he's going to be on the show every week. Jericho was on the show last week. He's not going to be on the show every week. Hopefully. It's all about CM Punk. But you need another star. Whether it's Samoa Joe, and it's obviously Samoa Joe's not at the level of star of CM Punk, but in terms of in-ring work and treating him like a credible star, you could do a lot with him. But they probably do need some more star power. Wednesday night needs the star power of CM Punk. And Saturday night needs more than just the star power of CM Punk. I agree with you there. And one more thing, we make the comment now. Wonder what is in that belt bag that Punk has carrying around? Because it seems to me odd that if it was the AEW world title belt that he never lost, that he would have pulled it out and showed it by now. What do you think? It's the spinner belt, the old WWE spinner belt that he has I know there's, there? maybe there's something going on or maybe now that i've said that that will plant a seed and there will be something going on maybe a snake maybe Jake but it just, gave him a bag with a snake in it well i don't know it, it it's not moving so i don't think it's alive but it seems odd that he wouldn't pull it right out right and say i well, never lost this well that's how vince got in trouble by pulling it out and saying i never lost this maybe it's his laundry maybe it's his laundry in the bag well no vince vince got in trouble just because he pulled it out and hit it several times not because he ever lost it anyway <laughs> are we done are we delirious uh, yet <laughs> we're done yes you're hunter and i'm ja all right we're done. Uh, we're coming back on the drive through and more news, hopefully by that uh, point in time. And until then, thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody.